My name is Tricia Rose. I'm the director for the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America here at Brown. And um, we hold a variety of kinds of events on race, ethnicity, on inequality, on social justice, on creative expression. Um, and, uh, and I want to encourage you, if you have didn't find this from our mailing list, to sign up on our mailing list outside and make sure you are aware of other things that come up. Um, so I want to thank you for coming on a Friday afternoon. And I want to thank our amazing guests. This is a fantastic group of people who were probably busy before November, but who might be a little extra busy now after November. And uh, so I'm very grateful that they would come here and share their insights with us. Um, it's an honor and a delight, for sure. Um, and although um, I will say um, that our uh, we did plan this before the Trump election. Um, we didn't know how useful it was going to be and how critical it was going to be until, until that fateful day. Um, before I introduce the brains behind this operation, I want to thank the staff because at CSREA, we, as they say metaphorically, punch way above our weight. And that's mainly, probably almost entirely due to the best possible staff anyone could have. So I want to thank them both a lot because by the time you get to April, you know, it's it's a very tough, exhausting period of time and things are always done really perfectly. So I really want to thank them uh, a great deal. But I mostly want to thank uh, Jalidi Matos, who is a, just a fantastic postdoctoral fellow at CSREA, nearing the end of her two-year appointment here, sadly. But she's been a great uh, community member, citizen, participant in seminars. Uh, in the classroom and art exhibits and the brains behind this operation. One of the things we try to do at CSREA is give our postdoctoral fellows opportunities to envision programs and colleagues around themes and topics that are especially relevant for their research and that play an important role on campus, right? Not to just have everything be my personal muse. I could, but it wouldn't be. It would only entertain me. Um, and this would have happened anyway, but Jalidi and I thought about this for quite a while, and, and she did most of the intellectual heavy lifting, so I want to thank her a great deal for that. It was very, very generous. So let me introduce Jalidi, and she will introduce the event uh, more specifically. Um, Professor Jalidi Matos received her PhD in political science from The Ohio State University. She's currently a presidential postdoctoral fellow based both in Watson and at the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. Her research on public opinion on restrictive immigration policy stems from both a personal and professional investment in the topic. She's currently working on her first book where she examines contemporary immigration laws and policies and argues that, they, that these policies should be understood within a historical context that recognizes the centrality of racial formations and the connections between different racial projects in the continual imagining of America and Americans. Her project traces the more contemporary and internal flow of the Latino, Latina immigrants to different parts of the US. And in the fall of 2017, our very own Jalili Matos will be an assistant professor at Rutgers, New Brunswick, in the Department of Political Science and Latino and Caribbean Studies. Please join me in welcoming Jalidi Matos. All righty. Thank you so much for being here today um, and for your time. Uh, thank you, Tricia, for that lovely introduction. And also thank you to the staff at CSREA and our uh, co-sponsors as well, the Taubman Center, uh, the Latino Studies Fund, and the Department of American uh, Studies and Ethnic Studies. Um, so today I'm going to briefly just frame the event and give you a sense of uh, sort of my thinking around why I wanted to have this event, um, as well as introduce to you our keynote speaker, um, and a little bit later I'll introduce to you our panelists. U.S. immigration policies, alongside other race-based policies, have been used to define who, it, who is included and who is excluded from the American polity. Given this history, who have, who have, who, what have been the key immigration policies that have ultimately defined Americanism? What role have race and ethnicity played in the history of immigration policies? And how do we understand our current political, social, and economic situation? In other words, how did we get here? And how do we move forward in such a racially tense environment? 
These were some of the questions that motivated me to organize a symposium of scholars whose expertise can elucidate the answers to some of these questions. Immigration within the contemporary political discourse is situated as a main source of insecurity. As an issue, immigration is deployed to address the insecurity of American borders, the US borders, state lines, neighborhood and county borders, as well as the more figurative ones, such as bodies. Conversations about immigration, border, national security, upon closer examination, are in part about belonging. In fact, immigration in the United States has, has been and continues to be about the delineations of boundaring, boundaries and belonging. By definition, immigration delimits American national identity. In his book, To Be an American, Cultural Pluralism and the Rhetoric of Assimilation, Bill on Hing argues that, and I quote, the current cycle of nativism comes at a time when immigration is dominated by Asians and Latinos. As a result, the discussion of who is and who is not American and who can and cannot become American goes beyond the technicalities of citizenship and residency requirements. It strikes at the very heart of our nation's long and troubled history and legacy of race relations, end quote. American national identity is a cultural and political identity that defines the discursive parameters of who belongs and who does not belong. Borders, then, become a spatial site where national security is enacted and performed. These borders, whether the physical or the imagined kinds, are the sites in which immigration battles are fought and Americanness is contested. Lilia Fernandez, in her book, Brown in the Windy City, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans in Post-War Chicago, reminds us that Latinos' ethno-racial identity as possibly brown can broaden our understanding of race in America. However, she also states that Americans struggle to grasp Latinos as a population. She states, and I quote, some continue to see Latinos and Latinas as recent arrivals, newcomers needing assimilation, or at worst, illegitimate members of American society. Such characterizations are surely informed not just by ongoing immigration, but also by the perplexing and seemingly incomprehensible ethno-racial identity of Latinos and Latinas, end quote. We continue to witness Professor Fernandez's observations across many ethno-racial groups in America. Ultimately, Fernandez's work reiterates Professor Hing's arguments about the importance of race in conversation about immigration and migration. Alongside the emergence of the fight over Americanness has been an emergence of vigilantism by both authorized members of the community, but also by private citizens. Americans have been especially vigilant against those who do not fit their imagined community, which then gets described as protecting American values rather than the more accurate description of racism. Official legislation, whether enacted or not, like the USA Patriot Act, 287G, and Secure Communities Programs, discursively construct South Asians, Muslim, and Arab Americans, as well as Latinos, as the prime targets of vigilantism. Moreover, conceptions of these laws often define the parameters of an imagined community that places immigrants, regardless of immigration status or birthplace, on the outskirts of American national identity. This then results in the treatment of such groups as un-American and thus not deserving of rights, security, and protection. In more recent years, we have seen the emergence and importance of geopolitics and geography more broadly vis-a-vis -vis immigration. Acts of violence continue to be reported across the country, not just at the US borders. As a country, we've witnessed a flow of immigrants away from cities known as immigrant hubs to lesser known communities uh, and counties and more rural areas in states like Alabama and Utah. With the move to more white spaces, vigilantism, anti-immigrant sentiments, and state-level immigration legislation have emerged. Professor Baraclough's scholarly work, in particular her book, Making the San Fernando Valley, Rural Landscapes, Urban Development, and White Privilege, is important given her focus on whiteness and how whiteness gets described, envisioned, and defined by space and place. Her examination of the socio-spatial construction of whiteness allows us as readers and scholars to ask questions such as what happens when non-white bodies move into spaces that have been constructed as white. Her suggestions that, and I quote, efforts to shape and influence policy are crucial sites for the formation and negotiation of identity, end quote, is currently being played out in localities across the country. 
The United States is a country with contradictory values and legacies. On the one hand, the US has always considered itself a nation of immigrants. America has welcomed immigrants, whether German, Irish, Catholic, or Protestant, and opened its door to opportunity. On the other hand, America has a distinct racial legacy, one of exclusionary racial, racial projects. How do we begin to unpack the ways in which America's racial legacy overrides its nation of immigrants discourse? Professor Perry argues in her recent book, The Cultural Politics of US Immigration, Gender, Race, and Media, that even though, and I quote, pluralism is celebrated as a national value, yet the diversity that immigrants carry over the border has been perceived as a threat to the complexion, economy, and unity of the nation, making immigration a perpetual topic of debate, end quote. Professor Perry's work brings a perspective that takes into account both race and gender, as well as popular culture, in arguing that law and culture are not separate, but rather interrelated spheres. In light of present-day immigration laws, executive orders, related demonstrations, and protests, I aim to put together a group of scholars that are well-equipped to answer pertinent and timely questions. In particular, the event is interested in asking how immigration laws of the past continue to affect our country today. For example, what legacies are, have IRCA and IRA-IRA left, and how are these policies being amended and used today? And what future will these and more contemporary policies and executive orders fashion? In light of such an already traumatic 2017, how might we forge a way forward? What is the future of the US immigration regime? The keynote speaker and our panelists bring with them vast knowledge from interdisciplinary perspectives, including history, American studies, cultural and ethnic studies, and legal studies, as a way to begin to answer these questions. Now, without further ado, I am honored to introduce to you our keynote speaker, Professor Bill Ong Hang. Bill Ong Hang is a professor of law and director of the Immigration and Deportation Defense Clinic at the University of San Francisco. He teaches immigration policy, rebellious lawyering, negotiation, and evidence. He is the author of numerous academic and practice-oriented books and articles on immigration and community lawyering. His books include Eth Ethical Borders, NAFTA, Globalization, and Mexican Migration, Deporting Our Souls, Values, Morality, and Immigration Policy, Defining America Through Immigration Policy, and Making and Remaking Asian America Through Immigration Policy. His book, To Be an American, Cultural Pluralism and the Rhetoric of Assimilation, received the award for Outstanding Academic Book in 1997 by the Librarian's Journal Choice. He, was, he has written myriad of law reviews and journal articles in a variety of venues, including the Journal of Law, Economics, and Policy, the Stanford Journal of Law and Policy, as well as opinion pieces and blog posts in venues such as the Huffington Post, the Los Angeles Times, and the New York Times. He was also co-counsel co in the president-setting Supreme Court asylum case, the INS versus Cardoso Fonseca. Professor Hing is the founder of and continues to volunteer as general counsel for the Immigrant Legal Re Resource Center in San Francisco. He serves on the National Advisory Council of the Asian American Justice Center in Washington, DC. Throughout his career, Professor Bill Ong Hing pursued social justice through a combination of community work, litigation, and scholarship. Professor Hing has been the awardee of many honors, including the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Centro Legal de la Raza, Keepers of the American Dream Award, National Immigration Forum by the National Immigration Forum, and the Tobriner Public Service Award by the San Francisco Legal Aid Society. Most recently, he was an honoree at the 2017 Rebellious Lawyering Conference where his work was celebrated. In my graduate and postgraduate career, Professor Hing's work has been invaluable, crucial, and incredibly timely. It, was, it is with great honor that I introduce to you our keynote speaker, Professor Bilong Hang. Thank you. All right, let's see if I can figure this out. So thank you for that generous introduction and congr congratulations on your new appointment. That's such a thrilling time in your career. Um, 
And thank you to Dr. Rose for the invitation. I'm going to put her on the spot and incorporate her in my opening remarks. So I want you to think back a few days or a few weeks before the November elections and be honest with us. What were you thinking a few days or a few weeks before the election? What were you thinking of, of doing and spending your time on before the election? Be honest. Okay, uh, I was uh, I was thinking about how to push Hillary to the left. <laughs> there you go, a woman after my own heart. As as, as a matter of fact, uh, I was assuming I have a reason to be pushing Hillary. Although I was a little scared, I was actually increasingly frightened and uncomfortable. It seemed more possible than I thought it should that Trump would win, but I still thought most of my energy would be spent. Absolutely. So a week before the general election, I was on a conference call uh, with the policy team of the Immigrant Legal Resource Center. They have an office in Washington and people in the Central Valley and San Francisco, and we were, our plan, we were planning on how to push, how the LRC staff could push uh, the contemplated new administration to, for example, uh, stop throwing so-called criminal immigrants under the bus uh, to, for example, uh, expand, to maintain the defense of DAPA that Obama had proposed and that was being hung, hung up in the courts, uh, to expand prosecutorial discretion. Um, a few days before the election, in typical kind of academic fa fashion, I'm thinking, okay, when am I going to, I'm on partial sabbatical this year. How am I going to find the time to finish the book that I'm working on criticizing the Obama administration for the treatment of unaccompanied children from Central America? And uh, I think I can figure out how to do that and still work on this textbook that I'm working with Jennifer Chacon and, and uh, Kevin Johnson on. Um, that, that's the academic in me. And then the day before the election, at UCLA, I was invited to uh, uh, the Network for Justice Planning Summit uh, that was sponsored by the American Bar Association that was titled, Welcome to, Fu to the Future of Latinos. And um, it was an interdisciplinary research initiative. And this is, this is the Monday before the election. And we had so much work that we completed that day in terms of the planning, teams that were going to be working on different issues, um, and we had students that were excited on work, working with us on different projects and um, haven't heard from them again. Uh, the day after the election, I got a call from one of my former colleagues at UC Davis, um, a woman named Afra Ashurapur who lives in San Francisco. She does this crazy commute to, to Davis that I used to do. And it's, it's Wednesday afternoon. She calls me up and says, uh, Bill, I, I need you to come over to the elementary school that I take my kids to in Noe Valley in San Francisco. Um, parents arrived at school this morning crying with their children. They're worried that Trump is coming to deport them. And I, I'm not exaggerating. I have been back to that school now three times in addition to a multitude of, of other schools, neighborhoods, uh, community events, that kind of thing that I'll allude to a little bit more in a second. Um, so what I want to do today is, is talk um, and compare uh, what some of Trump's proposals are, what he's actually done with, um, with what I've seen in my lifetime and a little bit of what we've all learned about prior to our lifetimes and see where we are. I want to talk about uh, the reports of widespread fear and whether or not uh, uh, 
whether or not that's true, and why is there fear if there is fear and hysteria? Is there fear? Is the fear justified? Uh, and these types of closing remarks that you see on here. Um, so let me just dive right into it because I, there's a lot that I want to talk about today. Um, and these are some of the things that I want to review very quickly in the beginning of my presentation that um, the president has either implemented or proposed. And I'll talk about each one of them a little bit more clearly in a minute. Uh, some were alluded to in the introduction. Uh, so as we know, uh, he's now on version 2.0 of the travel ban. And the, the, travel, the initial travel ban targeted seven countries and had very, very loose language about uh, not allowing in anyone from those seven countries of the Middle East uh, in pretty much period, not allowing anyone. So it was written in such a broad manner that uh, it included people with lawful permanent resident status, so-called green card status, which we all know they're not green cards anymore. Uh, and, and also people who already had visas in hand that, that they wouldn't be able to enter as well. Um, and really, the, the, it was written that broadly and immediately at least four different federal district courts across the country put a halt to those travel bans as being, as having two or three problems. One, there was a constitutional problem in terms of the First Amendment. The First Amendment is not just about speech. It's got an establishment of religion prohibition in it as well. And, uh, and so the evidence that the judges accepted in, in enjoining or stopping the initial travel ban on the First Amendment ground was evidence out of Trump's own mouth that uh, his intent from the primaries through after the election, through discussions with um, former Mayor Giuliani, was that he wanted to stop Muslims from entering the country. And the evidence of Mayor Giuliani saying, well, this is what I was asked to do, and this is what you see as a result of being asked to draft the parameters of a Muslim ban, um, and several other comments that his inner circle had made. Um, so that was a problem with the First Amendment ground, that, that it was a violation of the Establishment Clause. Then there's this technical problem that every president has, including President Obama. Um, how much are you authorized to do as the executive? How much can you yourself implement the federal immigration laws. And uh, you are charged with the responsibility for enforcing the immigration laws. So how far can you go when you enforce the immigration laws? And, um, and his argument hung on a provision of the law, Section 212F of the uh, Immigration and Nationality Act, that says that the president can actually uh, uh, go after classes of aliens that are coming to do us harm and can suspend their entry. Now think about that for a moment. If that's what the language is, that you can suspend the entry of those that are coming to do us harm, um, you can do that. The problem is that when you name an entire country, that's when former acting attorney general Sally Yates said, time out here, Mr. President. I cannot defend that because there's evidence that people have entered from those seven countries that are not coming here to do us harm. And so sure enough, which well, she got fired for that, of course, but sure enough, that's what the four district courts said. You're defining it too broadly. You cannot say that everybody from those seven countries is coming to do us harm. And during that period of time, of course, our own military stood up for Iraqi nationals and, and pointed to examples of folks they had worked with in Iraq and how helpful they were and 
um, and, and uh, that it was crazy to try to exclude everybody from Iraq. And so version 2.0 uh, drops Iraq for that reason, but everything else pretty much stayed the same, except that they also made it clear now that somebody with a green card, lawful permanent resident status, and people with visas in hand are not covered by the ban. But again, it, honestly, it doesn't take a lawyer to figure this out. He's now saying everyone from six countries are coming here to do us harm. And again, they, they can't win that argument. They can't win that argument. Now, there are three federal judges that have agreed with what I just said. There's one federal judge in Virginia that does not agree with what I just said. And so, uh, so there's a three to one split in federal court opinions. Um, I'm 100% confident that when this gets to the Court of Appeals in what's called a Ninth Circuit, which covers the Western states, they'll reach the same conclusion as the three, uh, as what they did back in January or February. Um, and time will tell whether or not the, the Federal Court of Appeals that covers Virginia, what it will do. But in the meantime, uh, nothing has been implemented right now. And I, I imagine that until President Trump narrows his attack on certain groups um, to the, in the manner that President Obama and President Bush did, he actually will not have that statutory authority. And how they did it was they named specific terrorist organizations. I didn't agree with them. But by naming specific terror organizations, they at least have a factual chance of supporting the ban. Naming six countries is just way over-inclusive and a violation of the Equal, Protect Equal Protection Clause in addition to the statutory authority. So what, what's it reminiscent of in terms of comparative stuff? Well, I'm not going to talk about the Asian exclusion laws, but uh, I, I was around uh, I started practicing immigration law in 1974. Uh, in 1979, uh, uh, many of you saw the movie Argo a couple years ago when uh, the uh, Iranian students took over the U.S. Embassy in Tehran for more than a year. Uh, in response to that, President Carter ordered the largest group of F-1 students in the United States to report to the Immigration and Naturalization Service. That largest group was Iranian students. They were the largest F-1 student group in the United States at the time. They all had to come in and report. They did not all get deported, but many of them did. Those that were under, either had worked without permission off campus, or were taking 11 units instead of the required 12 units, or whatever it takes to have a full load, they were deported highly technical violations. And so that was, um, there were two separate courts of appeal decisions on the legality of that roundup, and they were deemed, it was deemed within the president's authority to call in people of a specific race to determine, or nationality, to determine whether or not they were in compliance with their student visas, and that was, that was sustained. Um, and then, of course, uh, we don't all need much reminding about post-9-11 that, uh, that under the Patriot Act and, uh, and other independent actions of the Department of Justice, which at that time controlled the Immigration and Naturalization Service, is right before the D Department of Homeland Security was established, uh, th uh, there were also calls for people from Muslim countries on non-immigrant visas to come into the United, to in, come into INS. Many disappeared for days, uh, and uh, something called the NSEERS program, a national entry and exit registry program was established. Uh, it wasn't until the Obama administration that was removed, uh, and that's all been upheld, where, uh, again, it's similar to the Iranian situation. People in those visa categories can be asked to come in to have their visas reviewed. Uh, so it's not exactly a travel ban, but uh, the, the idea of bringing in people of particular nationalities is similar. Um, 
His call for so-called extreme vetting uh, is, has got a lot of people puzzled because there's already extreme vetting. Uh, there's a terrorist that began with George Bush and expanded under President Obama. Uh, there's a terrorist watch database. There's an immigrant violator database. There's grounds of inadmissibility. Every immigrant and non-immigrant applicant to the United States has to go through very rigorous uh, application process and a laundry list of grounds of inadmissibility. There's fingerprinting involved. There's interviews involved. Uh, and uh, honestly, uh, people are wondering, what more can you do uh, to, to so-called vet people? Uh, and um, I, I think it's more smoke and mirrors, this language. The refugee process alone takes two to three years to get a refugee visa. It involves not just the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, but it involves the Department of Justice once, not once, but twice, because it's DOJ generally, and then it's FBI separately, then it's the Department of Homeland Security, and then it's the Department of State. And so there's just no way that the screening hasn't been strong in the refugee because, you know, I'm not a big admirer of George Bush, but you know, he wasn't that stupid, you know, the people that worked for him. They, they, they were trying to figure out if anyone was trying to come us, do us harm, and, and Obama was right up there in terms of vetting. Um, expedited removal is, um, is something that, that is, uh, it, it's a process where you can, deport, basically remove somebody without a hearing in front of an immigration judge. And the law provides that anyone with, who has lived here for less than two years can be subject to expedited removal. The, President Obama, who we loved chastising and labeling the deporter in chief, but still wishing we had him back for some reason, uh, uh, the, uh, he, his numbers were way up there in large part because of expedited removal for anyone within 100 yards of the border, including, I might add, a lot of Mexican unaccompanied children that are treated differently than unaccompanied children from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador for technical reasons, dealing with trafficking laws. And, um, and, and so, uh, uh, but he limited it to 100 miles, anyone caught within 100 miles of the border who had been here for less than two years. Trump has announced uh, he's taking this kind of dormant provision and expanding it uh, to anywhere in the United States. If in the interior memo that was issued on January 25th, executive order, uh, says that anyone caught who has lived here for less than two years anywhere in the United States will be subject to expedited removal. And that's pretty clever because the law can be read in a way that permits that. Um, and it, it actually is an example of the fact that there are a handful of people that are advising him on immigration matters who know what they're doing. The most notable one is Chris Kobach, who is currently the Attorney General of Kansas, I guess. and. Um, um, he was the author of Arizona's SB 1070. He was the author of Alabama's HB 56. Uh, I can go on and on. Uh, he's a professional consultant to governments for authoring anti-immigration law laws. He authored a couple ordinances, for example, that would make it unlawful to rent to undocumented immigrants, that kind of thing. And, and so Chris Kobach, uh, his, he came up with this, uh, and some of the more uh, smarter uh, proposals. Uh, but at any rate, we have seen it, but this is different. He, uh, there, we haven't actually seen it implemented yet, but that's a proposal. And so when we do our Know Your Rights presentations, we tell people three things, minimally. One, remind, right to remain silent. Two, don't carry any evidence that you were not born in the United States. And three, at home, if you've lived here for more than two years, keep a file of evidence that you've lived here for more than two years. Um, credible fear processing applies to people that um, uh, are fleeing. 
uh, for violence. Uh, and it can be the, the types that we see in our clinic at USF, all we represent actually are Central Americans. And uh, it's domestic, gang, or, or um, cartel violence. And uh, you have to, when you arrive at the border, you're screened. And not by an immigration judge, but by the Border Patrol or some other immigration agent. And they're supposed to give you a preliminary screening, but not demand evidence that you're going to be persecuted. And uh, there's criticism that Obama's folks applied it too stringently. But now uh, Trump has announced that they're really going to clamp down on people approaching at the border. And there's uh, Right before the election and then right after the election, the screening got worse uh, at, at um, San Isidro and Nogales. Uh, it's very difficult to get in now. It, it, Haitians have been trying to get in through that port of, those ports of entries and, um, and others um, from Central America, and they're running into brick walls. We have a special project related to that. Um, so. President Obama loved making speeches about deporting gangbangers and serious felons and, and um, talking about, uh, what was his phrase? I'm trying to remember it. Uh, that uh, we're, we're, we, we're going to deport gangbangers and serious felons, not family members, implying that they don't have families, which, of course, is a problem. And, uh, and President Obama did engage in operations where they would go in with warrants for individuals. And while there, his ICE did ask people who happen to be there also for their immigration papers, what would be called collateral arrest. So there were some people that were not criminals, many people that were not criminals that were arrested and deported by the Obama administration. Uh, but that is one thing that Trump wants to expand greatly, and he's beginning with the expansion of the definition of criminal immigrants. His definition of criminal immigrants in the executive orders is anyone who's just been arrested and, and not yet convicted. That's a criminal immigrant. And, and why does that make a difference? The reason that makes a difference is because the vast majority of, of county and city police departments cooperate with ICE. The vast majority are very willing, and this is related to the topic of the threat of defunding sanctuary cities. Uh, they, they, when they think somebody's undocumented, they'll call ICE up. The vast majority of law enforcement officials in the country do that. Um, and, and so uh, Obama interior deportation figures were about, uh, 1,250 per month, not the border, but interior deportation figures under Obama was 1,250 per month. Those were almost all referrals from local law enforcement officials. You can be sure that that number is going to increase. And, and TRAC at Syracuse University, uh, T-R-A-C, it's an acronym for something, uh, they keep data on, on immigration enforcement, and so we're waiting for the new data to come up. And they will also engage in collateral arrests, and I'll allude to this in a minute again, but uh, the, the, the enforcement activities that have occurred so far around the country have somewhat been related to people who are on a list, and it could be criminal, and of course they're asking everyone else at the apartment building or at the work site for their immigration documents. Um, he pledged, Trump pledged to deport millions of undocumented immigrants, and as I said, so far, uh, and people can correct me if I'm wrong, I do try to keep track of this, there haven't been the types of large rates that I'll, I'll tell you about in a minute. Uh, and, but that doesn't mean that they won't do that. Um, uh, one thing for sure is that ICE, many ICE, employees have been waiting for this day. Um, they, they were pissed off at Obama for DACA, and then the DAPA, they didn't like prosecutorial discretion. They sued Obama, saying, you're not allowing us to do our work. 
Um, they always got thrown out of court, but the ICE suits always got thrown out of court. But um, they've been waiting to be unleashed, like Dobermans. And, uh, uh, you know, so uh, let's wait and see just how many of these kinds of raids actually occur. Um, in the past, of course, we've seen a lot of raids. Um, the Palmer raids were political raids aimed at, at workers. There was uh, one day that a million workers in the United States went out and strike. Can you imagine? Uh, uh, because they wanted to organize. And this was a way of attacking union organizing. The most infamous one was in January 2nd, 1920, in one day there were raids all across the country and 3,000 people were arrested in one, one day. And, and, and we're talking, it was mostly immigrant workers uh, that were part of that, which is kind of interesting, right? Because that's what unions are relying on today, are immigrant workers, um, what's left of unions. Uh, the uh, Mexican repatriation, there's a lot been written on that in the last few years. Uh, <laughs> Uh, probably about another million people were deported under th in this era. And what is most mind-boggling is that two-thirds were U.S. citizens. Let me repeat that. Two-thirds were U.S. citizens that were asked to leave the country. And of course, it's illegal to deport U.S. citizens, but they coerced into leaving. Repatriation was a, a euphemism for deportation. And, uh, you know, so, uh, again, I'm looking ahead, but. You think there's fear now? Well, you know, I think there were there's fear back then. Operation Wetback, another million folks were deported in 1954, primarily Mexicans, as a precursor to building up the Bracero program. Um, fear, the Bush raids, um, gun-toting raids at work sites in particular were very common. Uh, 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 there was a December 2016, 20, 2006, uh, there was one raid, one day of raids that was planned at all the, well, six SWIFT, S-W-I-F-T, SWIFT meat pop packing plants around the country. They're mostly in rural parts of the United States. Uh, 6,000 workers were detained. Again, half of the detainees that day were U.S. citizens. Now, they didn't all get deported, but they were detained for anywhere from four to eight hours while their data was checked. And uh, it, it was uh, the big lawsuits after that. Um, Obama and Janet Napolitano, who was DHS secretary, promised not to do those raids, types of raids. And they pretty much kept to that promise, uh, except for these criminal kind of situations. Um, he engaged more in silent raids, and that's taking a briefcase to the personnel office of businesses that they thought employed undocumented immigrants and checking I-9 forms. We all have to fill out an I-9 one, and, and they do have legal access to I-9 records, and uh, they, all, they only have to give three days notice to the employer. We're coming in to do an I-9 audit when there's not a match with a social security number and names. They then send a no match letter to the employer and say, you gotta fire these people or clear, clear this up or fire these people. A lot of people lost jobs. They didn't get deported, but a lot of people got lost jobs. Um, so this has been in the news. Uh, he put the bid out. Uh, I, I've lost track of what, how many billions it's supposed to cost, but billions, right? And uh, double digit billions. And uh, Virtual fence bids are not acceptable, uh, but let's let's not forget. I mean, there there was a 2006 fence act that passed. I think it passed the Senate 80 to six. Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama voted voted for the fence act. Okay, uh, and uh, it, it didn't all get built. It was not much enthusiasm for funding the whole thing. Even among Republicans, there was not that much enthusiasm. They thought they could handle it virtually. Uh, but Operation Gatekeeper, which is in the early 1990s, that, that's, this is the part that, that I continue to this day to be most upset about. Uh, of among the different things that I'm upset about, this is the thing that I'm most upset about when it comes to immigration enforcement. 
uh, because Bill Clinton set up a death trap uh, that uh, they, they closed off the parts of the border that were most easy to traverse, expecting that people will then they, they'll be discouraged, losing sight of why people come here. They, they don't come here for adventure or to visit Disneyland. I mean, they're coming, honestly, they don't have a choice usually. Uh, and and um, I've lost count, I shouldn't have. I think it's over 6,000 deaths at the border, unnecessary. We, we, don't, we don't have to set this up in a way that we know people are gonna die. Um, and the wall's gonna continue to do that. People will still try to enter out of desperation. They will die in the summer in Arizona. They will die in the winter in the mountains. Um, and that's on us. Those people are dying because of us, because we put people in these positions to enforce the border that way. And that is the most shameful thing that's happened in my career as an immigration attorney. Um, two ASIM and G agreements, which were uh, alluded to, um, these are, a, this is a partnership between local law enforcement and the federal government where the federal government says, uh, we will deputize you to help us enforce immigration laws and give you some money to do that. Um, uh, under Bush, I think at one point there were at least 70 such agreements uh, around the country. Uh, Obama reduced it to about 30 because there was so much that went wrong, especially along the lines of what Sheriff Joe Arpaio did in Arizona, which completely racial profiling, that, that kind of thing. Uh, well, Trump has made a new commitment to expanding the 287G agreement. What's kind of kooky about it is that a lot of the local sheriff's departments want to do this because they think that it's a money maker, but they actually end up losing money um, because uh, they, they actually have to put money up front and uh, to do the enforcement and then they put in for reimbursement and they're not getting reimbursed at the rate uh, that they thought. And so there's, there's a lot of, of news reports on some counties being skeptical because they're gonna lose money. Um, again, the Secure Communities Program was which also alluded to, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a fingerprint sharing program that was expanded, honestly, under the Obama administration. It started a little bit under Bush, but it was fully expanded under Obama. What it is is that whenever a police uh, department arrests someone and fingerprints them, the fingerprints automatically go to the FBI that's, that's an act of due diligence. They want to make sure that the person that they've arrested isn't an abscondee or uh, is wanted by someone else. And so, so they do that. Obama and Bush said, well, since we have the fingerprints in the Department of Justice, why can't we get access to those fingerprints from the Department of Homeland Security to check on their immigration status? And so, in fact, there's a couple great reports on Secure Communities Program uh, that have indicated that many people who got deported that way, in other words, when there was no fingerprints, um, the vast majority of people deported were not serious criminals. They were minor offenders or were never offenders. Uh, and one of the big advocacy, advocacy groups that advocated against, uh, uh, in favor of closing down Secure Communities were actually organizations that were victims, that represent victims of domestic violence. Because when, when a, a, what I've heard is that when there's a call to the police on a domestic violence situation, the police often don't really know exactly who's the victim and who's the perpetrator, so they often fingerprint both parties and once they fingerprint it, it goes to the FBI, and so there have definitely been uh, victims of domestic violence who were deported uh, because, because of secure communities. Um, so he didn't close it down, Obama, until November 2014. Uh, but Trump has pledged to reinstitute it fully. Um, the sanctuary city funding threat uh, is something that, it's a, uh, it's become a big deal because some cities are, are, are afraid that they're gonna lose federal funding. Uh, and uh, San Francisco, 
um, I think, I may be not looking at it globally, is kind of at the center of this, um, uh, in part because there was a bad shooting in San Francisco in the middle of the primaries. Uh, there was an innocent woman who just happened to be walking uh, with her parents doing tourist stuff, and there was a bullet that was shot from a gun that ricocheted from the sidewalk and killed her. Uh, and it was allegedly an undocumented immigrant who had stole a gun from a car. Uh, and it was somebody who the police had turned over, who, who didn't turn over because he didn't have any serious criminal record. Uh, and so at that time, there was a call for defunding sanctuary cities of any federal funds. Uh, it, that legislation didn't get anywhere. I think that was the summer of 2015, uh, maybe, yeah, 2015. And the, uh, uh, but now Jeff Sessions and Trump have threatened to, to defund sanctuary cities and, and San Francisco is one of the targets, Santa Clara County, uh, New Haven actually, uh, a couple of other places like that. And uh, without getting into uh, too technical, the government will lose. The federal government will not win this case. Uh, they, they, the Supreme Court, I am predicting, even with Gorsuch on, will hold that this threat is a violation of the 10th Amendment. You cannot force state and local officials to do your federal work. And two, it's a violation also of the spending clause. You can condition federal spending on certain things with notice, but the penalty can only be five to 10%. And so you cannot hold back entirely. So that's, that's my prediction. Um, so the, what's occurred, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm living in a, in a state where, there's, where this is distorted, okay? Uh, but there's a lot of fear in immigrant communities. And um, there's a lot of different headlines, of course, and, and you can, hear about it, you can, uh, and, and uh, because of that, uh, there's been a lot of know your rights presentations, even family emergency plans that are part of know your rights presentations, it's, it's signing guardian, temporary guardianship papers in case you cannot pick up your kids at school or in case you're not there to make medical decisions for them. That, that's part of the packet that we present to people. Um, why? Well, this is something that you all know as well as I do. I, uh, he's everywhere, right, uh, talking about this. Well, I'm sure his poll numbers are going to go up after what he did yesterday, but um, uh, he, he's got a lot of support uh, for his anti-immigrant stuff. Uh, he was elected on an anti... He, he's. Um, it's kind of a seeming, seemingly reckless immigration enforcement. Uh, media coverage is constant, social media. I mean, even Latinos call it, you know, that they hear about these things on El Facebook, you know, kind of thing. And uh, I don't think that the Obama deportation stuff or the Bush deportation stuff was covered quite as much. And besides that, they would both occasionally say good things about immigrants, even Bush. And uh, Bush wanted to have, I didn't like it, but he, he talked about having a massive guest worker program because he thought that we need low wage, low income workers. Um, I, I, I think I'm putting on here that, that, that the fear and hysteria actually might be good. <laughs> we, I might be contributing to the fear and, his, and my allies might be, you know, because there's such a big network of allies, immigrant groups that highlight these things. One false move by ICE, and it's out there, it's reported. Um, and there's mass, when we do our Know Your Rights training, we, we try to contextualize it and tell people the chances that you actually are gonna be deported and you're gonna need to know this is small, but it's like insurance in case you are. Um, but I do wonder whether or not we're, we're contributing to the fear. Now, is the fear justified? Well, you know, he's, he is crazier and more out of control than most people. 
Um, and, and, and I do think that we'll see a measurable enforcement increase interior. As I said, there's renewed vigor among the ranks. Uh, there are going to be more collateral arrests and detentions. Uh, that uh, the reports, there's been reports of ICE actions at course, ho courthouses, health clinics, and schools. Now, there was a policy, not courthouses, but there was a policy that health clinics, schools, and churches were labeled sensitive localities that they wouldn't go to. Well, they, there have definitely been reports that they've shown up at courthouses when they think somebody might be an immigrant who's undocumented and or was being facing a crime. But there's also been reports that they've been outside of schools and clinics. And so that would be a violation of sensitive locations. Um, and also, at least there had been conversation up until now about con comprehensive immigration reform, and that's not happening. Um, you know, and so what's this all about? Well, you know, I think it's a lot about um, who's the target. Uh, obviously, we know who the, the travel bans are. If you just go to the newspapers and see who's being arrested, um, there's a lot of Latinos' names, okay, Spanish surnames uh, of people that have been arrested and deported. We know that what he's implementing, these secure communities, the 287G agreements, um, the results are people from uh, Latin American countries, and um, that's just a fact. Uh, and so, I, I uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I was sitting in the waiting room of, of a uh, car wash in Redwood City, and there were, it was about seven o'clock, it was long after closing time, and there were about 50 car wash workers that were ga gathered in the room, and I was looking around the room as, uh, I actually didn't do anything that night. Uh, I had trained students who speak a lot better Spanish than me to do the training, and do, they were doing the training. I, was, the training. I was looking around the room, and uh, uh, th these folks were taking it seriously, and they asked very hard questions. There was a little bit of laughing at, uh, at some of the role plays that my students were doing, uh, but when they, when they asked the questions, it was clear that they had been paying attention, and they wanted to know everything about what they can and cannot do what they should and shouldn't carry on the job or at their kid's school or at, uh, you know, walking on the street. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's not that complex that, you know, he, Trump wants to disrupt the lives, lives of these workers and their families. And he, I, I really do think that he wants to create confusion. He wants people to be afraid. He wants people to, in the words of Mitt Romney, to self-deport. And, uh, and I think that that's intentional. Um, we can stop some of these con unconstitutional actions uh, when they racially, they can't racially profile. There will be evidence of racially profiling. There will be courts to say you can't do that. They will lose some monetary judgments when they arrest citizens. But it, the, the point will have been made. Um, the, We've seen this before, as you could tell, and, um, and I think that he has, when, back 20 years ago in California when Prop 187 passed, which was the aunt, kids couldn't go to school if they were undocumented or if their parents were undocumented, that um, uh, they couldn't access public assistance. Um, we've seen this before when there was a lot of support for anti-immigrant stuff in California. I don't think, Prop 187 would pass today in California, but I worry about the rest of the country because uh, three quarters of Trump's support during the primaries were pro-deportation, anti-refugee voters. And today, almost half of Republican voters favor deporting all undocumented immigrants and barring Syrian refugees. Um, so, I, I just think that even though his shenanigans indicate that we think that they're tripping over themselves, they have the time and they've been doing enough that they can cause this kind of harm. And it's a shame that, uh, that so much publicity gets 
uh, played, for example, about the wall. Because I, I had a debate with a former student of mine a couple of weeks ago about the wall. He said it was no big deal kind of thing. And I said, you know, I, I really think it is a big deal that if they built that wall. Because it, the walls are just such bad symbols. And, um, and the wall sends a message, actually, even though it's kind of silly, but if you saw the request for proposals, it's got to be aesthetically pleasing, but only from the US side. They don't give a damn what it looks like from the other side. But I actually think that the wall sends a message to immigrant communities on both sides of the border uh, that, that they're not wanted. And so the United States is, is more diverse than ever. And uh, this increased diversity is something that uh, has occurred over the last 150 years. Um, and uh, it, it, of course, began with what we did to Native Americans and what we did to African slaves. And then when Mexicans started coming in large numbers in the 1950s and Asian immigrants after 1965, um, the phrase, we are a nation of immigrants, uh, um, still captured the essence of largely a Eurocentric society. Uh, but what I classify what's going on today as um, is, is um, this vigilante type of racism that is emblematic of what's occurred in the various anti-immigrant movements that have gone on. And it's a message, it's a message of othering that is really about de-Americanizing folks. I don't know exactly what it takes, but I know when I'm looking at you, you're not an American. Um, and so our, the nation's public relations position is that we are a proud nation of immigrants and, and multiculturalism inclusive of all. But unfortunately, we, we take steps sometimes in the direction of inclusive, inclusiveness, but other times we take steps backwards uh, in that regard as well. And we learn and we unlearn in the process. The bad behavior of vigilante racism is reinforced in times like this because it's times like this, that this de-Americanization process of attacking communities of color perpetuate this image uh, as immigrants or folks that, that they're partial Americans and that they're not full Americans that are deserving of their place in the country. And that's when whatever the data shows, if there is a majority of Republicans that favor what's going on, I choose to believe that that's not a majority of Americans. And if I'm wrong, then I'm still going to fight until they understand that we all belong here as Americans. Thanks. Do you want to take your own questions? Why don't we, yeah. Cube, and you can ask your question, and you can pass it along. Wow, that's um, cool. I'm right? <laughs> you can pass it along other people as well, but you can also stand up if you'd like, but you can pass the cube along. You can even what? throw it. Yeah, you can even throw it. So I have the cube. That's we, every school you needs that. You can ask that. Yes. Okay. Um, Plyler versus Doe, that prohibits right. public schools from asking parents for um, immigration mm -hmm. status. Are you seeing a lot of violations of that? And are you worried that the Supreme Court might um, overturn that? Right. Um, so Plyer versus Doe was a case uh, against Texas for uh, passing a law that, uh, that undocumented children could not attend K through 12. And the Supreme Court, in a narrow decision, five to four, uh, written by, uh, well, I'm not sure if it was written by O'Connor, come to think of it, but it was a five to four opinion. I know O'Connor was in the majority, uh, that, that that was unconstitutional, that Texas could not stop 
undocumented children from attending K through 12. California tried that in Prop 187. Plyler was in the 1980s. Uh, and, uh, and when Prop 187 was challenged successfully, the federal judge cited Plyler versus Doe. Alabama's HB 56 attempted that through sleight of hand by saying, we're just gathering data. We just want to know what kids' parents' place of birth was, or something like that. And, and, uh, but that was also thrown out, uh, Alabama's attempt. Do I think that there are some folks that are thinking of ways of preventing undocumented children from going to public K through 12? Yeah, people are probably thinking of ways. There's not been another proposal yet that's passed that hasn't been upheld. I worry about the Supreme Court, for sure, because it was five to four, it was in the 1980s, it included O'Connor. Um, again, uh, without getting too hyper-technical legally, it surprised, the outcome surprised many legal scholars because the children were undocumented and the right to education was involved. This, I'm gonna say two things that may surprise you. The right to education is not a fundamental right under the United States Constitution. Because it's not a fundamental right, it doesn't trigger what the Supreme Court would ordinarily do when it's a fundamental right, which is apply strict scrutiny of, of the law. And then when it comes to undocumented folks, they're, they, they're, not considered, they're not considered what's called a suspect classification. When there's a suspect classification, the Supreme, Supreme Court also applies strict scrutiny, but undocumented immigration has never been categorized as a suspect classification. Lawful permanent residents, you can't discriminate against lawful permanent residents. That's a suspect classification, but undocumented immigrants, no. So the fact that the Supreme Court was not required to apply the strictest scrutiny surprised. There's a lot of law review articles written on why the Supreme Court did that, it was wrong or was right, why it was right, like, because it was muddled. And so because of that, the Supreme Court, the wrong Supreme Court, the wrong five people could overturn it. Yeah, so I do worry about it. It's back there. You want to throw this thing at him? Uh, <laughs> I feel like I'd uh, hit somebody. I will like throw it from midway. <laughs> right, or just hold on. Oh, it's a microphone. Oh, I get it. It's a microphone. That's why we were doing it. Sorry, we oh, didn't no, explain. I thought it was like a box you put the questions in. I was like, why do I have to write? All right. Uh, so going along with that question, are there any specific uh, court cases you've seen at the district or the circuit court level that you are actively worried about uh, with the new makeup of the Supreme Court? And yeah, it's kind of interesting that. Um, uh, so DACA is, is, uh, the, is an acronym for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. It, it's for people that were called dreamers, kids that came here undocumented when they were small and went to high school here and are going to college or joining the military. Um, uh, and, and so Obama felt, because he couldn't deliver comprehensive immigration reform, that he would at least grant them permission to stay here for a couple years and get employment permission and then get extensions of that for every two years. It's been a surprise that Trump didn't cancel that program because he had promised to cancel the DACA program, but it has so far so good, okay? Um, it's, it's business as usual. But one of the other things that Obama tried to do was something called the DAPA program, which is Deferred Action for Parents of U.S. Citizens and Lawful Permanent Residents. And that got hung up in court. Uh, and uh, it never got implemented. He would have granted employment permission and uh, no deportation for parents of U.S. citizens under DAPA. That got hung up in court. Uh, and it's supposed to be going to trial in D.C., but it got hung up because the Supreme Court was asked to allow it to go forward, but they tied four to four, okay? And so 
presumably Gorsuch, Gorsuch would make a difference. What's surprising is that Trump has not canceled the DAP amendment because um, we're not sure politically why he hasn't canceled that memo because it never went into effect. Um, and so it's going to go to trial. We, we don't think he's going to defend it. Uh, so it's a puzzle. But if, if somehow, miraculously, the judge in Texas rules that DAPA was constitutional and it gets to the Supreme Court again, then Gorsuch would make a difference. So that's one thing. There's always issues with, with respect to asylum interpretation. There's always issues with respect to something called cancellation of removal, which is you have to show extraordinary hardship if you're undocumented to get relief from deportation. Um, yeah, there, there are potential cases that will end up in the Supreme Court that are going to be problematic. Sure. For you. I, I have two questions. Um, so I'll ask them both, and then you can answer both or, or decide on one or the other. Um, my first question, um, some of the way that you um, maybe talked about Obama, for example, expanding certain things, um, I wondered what would look different without those expansions. Um, that Obama made that sort of laid the groundwork for some of the things that are actually going on now, right? So if we had a, a, somebody else who did something different, right, who, who didn't expand as much as Obama did, mm -hmm. um, and who, who didn't have actually this legacy of, of deporting as many people as he did, what mm -hmm. would look different maybe legally or maybe socially? And then the second question um, was about fear, right, and about how much we're actually contributing, some allies are actually contributing to fear. And so my question is, so what's an alternative? What's the yeah. alternative to, to, to Yeah, let me take that first, that last question first. I, I don't, that's what I keep on racking my brain about and talking to not just my students but other allies. We're doing the right thing, right? We're doing the right thing by doing these know your rights. We're not scaring people. And uh, uh, we, the thing is we've seen these know your rights presentations work. Uh, <coughs> in the Bay Area, there was a visit by an ICE officer in San Mateo <coughs> a couple weeks ago of a group, and the woman whose door was knocked on was happened to be at a training at, at the Catholic Charities. <coughs> and she went through the whole routine and said, I don't need to talk to you. I, don't, I know I don't need to talk to you. And that person that you're asking for isn't here. And after 15 minutes, which is a long time, ICE went away. Okay, so, uh, and I've heard it work in other contexts not recently, but in, in years past. Um, I, I think that if we explain to people that the chances are small that you're going to be deported, but here's some insurance, including red, we're handing out red cards, which if you go to the Immigrant Legal Resource Center website, you can order red cards, actually, for free where you distribute, and it's, it's I, there, it must be more than Spanish and English now. Um, but it says, I, I know I have a right to remain silent. I'm exercising that right. Please go away. Um, I know I can talk to an attorney kind of thing. And so people carry those around uh, in their wallets with them. Um, and if we explain to them that the chances are you won't need this, but this is, as I said, like an insurance policy, I, I, that's the best I can come up with. Um, in terms of, I, I don't think we're scaring people. I mean, there's some folks, again, my allies that are worried that some folks are using this to get more funding, too, that they're going to funders and saying, things are so bad, people are scared, you gotta give us more money to do services and that kind of stuff. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but you know that's that's part of every funding proposal now that immigrant rights organizations are doing is that, we're in a different era. There's threats of mass deportation. Look at this example that happened. You know, so uh, that. Your, your, your first question is, is really a good one. I, I actually think that the answer is that there would have been more of a social difference. Uh, and for example, if secure communities had not been expanded under Obama, or if, uh, 
if if credible fear stuff at the if oh gosh I mean if if they had not expanded these family detention centers in Texas for example I just really think that uh, I'm thinking of the lives of those women and children in the detention centers and you can read about the conditions in those places uh, would have been so much better. There are reports of people who were, were removed that have been killed upon return to especially the, the, the three countries, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador. Um, I, 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 I just was so disappointed that you know, we were in trouble when summer 2014, the big surge of Central Americans was coming in, and the Klan said, we should shoot some of those folks, and they'll get the message that they shouldn't be coming. Obama was also criticized for creating the problem because of DACA. Stop and understand what that criticism was, okay? Some people are saying, okay, because you're giving deferred action to dreamers who have lived in here all their lives, basically, you're sending a message to unaccompanied kids from those countries. It doesn't make any sense, right? But that was, he actually knuckled under to that pressure. So we were in trouble. <laughs> when the Klan gets that platform, and then Obama looks like he's giving in to that kind of criticism by treating them differently in his enforcement memos too. His enforcement memos specifically excluded people who were coming now to the border. And um, I, uh, I'm, I'm still gonna finish this book uh, attacking the treatment of unaccompanied children. Uh, because I still think that that was a mistake on the part of his administration, and um, and it's it's been very harmful to those kids and to those women and children that came and continue to come at, at a high rate because of the violence in those countries. Yeah. Any other questions? Laura. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what rebellious lawyering is and <laughs> yeah. how it's different in a Trump regime? Yeah, I, I get a lot of chuckles sometimes when people read that I teach rebellious lawyering. It's, it's not what ma many people think. Many people think that rebellious lawyering is about rebelling against Trump or rebelling against the ICE and rebelling against the government. Um, a lot of people who practice rebellious lawyering do that. Rebellious lawyering is rebelling against conventional lawyering. Uh, and so uh, you may have other names for it in your fields, uh, but it's practicing in a way where you respect the community and you respect the client. You look for allies because you realize that you are not a knight in shining armor and that other people have, can help solve it's about problem solving and, and figuring out a way to problem solve with the client and with allies. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's, for example, when you have an immigration case, it's making sure the client understands every single aspect of why you're doing what you're doing, every single requirement for asylum, and why you're doing what you're doing, why you're, whether or not the client can actually help you gather evidence because some clients are better at it than you are, and who in their community might be able to come and testify, who do they think uh, can corroborate some of this, who else uh, knows about what happened in your village that could help in the case kind of stuff. And so, so it's, it's more that. Uh, but in terms of, uh, specifically in terms of Trump, uh, I'll tell you, we are so concerned with his crazy, um, his craziness and his ideas that, yeah, I mean, we're doing what I just described, including 
working with litigators who don't always work in a rebellious manner, okay? Many litigators who are some of my best friends, they just said, give me the issue. I don't need to talk to the client, okay? Uh, and many litigators never talk to the client. They, they, and they win big and important cases. Uh, I won't tell you this, but you know, the attorney who won Doe versus Plyler is infamous for not being a rebellious lawyer. Okay, you can go look it up. He's still around. Uh, and, and so what, now when we're working with those litigators, um, which we do, we have to, um, even with the travel ban stuff, we, we make sure that those litigators are sitting down with us and helping to explain to folks what's going on and why and what the strategy is and why. And also we're looking for allies. We're actually looking for people who can influence Trump uh, because that's what we did with Obama and Bush and Clinton. We always look for people to work on the inside and um, we haven't found any good ones yet, but we're still hoping. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, during the election, there was a lot of talk on both sides, Republican and Democrat, about immigration reform. And basically, in this administration, we've heard about walls and bans, but we've had nothing about actual reform. And it seemed for a while there like both parties were both looking for reform, and it looked like there might be a place for some collaboration there to make yeah. some changes. And I'm just wondering if it's really dead in the water or if there is some behind the scenes negotiation that's going on that could mm -hmm. give us a little glimmer of hope? Right, the only behind the scenes, there is behind the Steve stuff, stuff going on on the DREAM Act uh, for DREAMers uh, because there are a number of moderate Republicans, Jeff Flake from Arizona, Lindsey Graham from South Carolina, where's he from? Um, and a couple of other folks that really believe in the DREAM Act, uh, Marco Rubio. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, there is conversation going on and perhaps that's why Trump hasn't canceled DACA. We don't know for sure. But every, everything else, I, I don't think there's anything else rather is on the table uh, with respect to that, which is very different from when, if, if Hillary had won, I think there would have been a lot because Right after Barack Obama won his second term, as you may recall, the Republicans were so down, they thought the only way we can ever win the White House is by passing immigration reform, by getting the Latino vote. Remember that, right? And, um, and so within months, I didn't like the final bill, but within months, the Senate passed comprehensive immigration reform after in the spring of 2013. Uh, and it, it died because of the Tea Party and John Boehner not being able to rally people in the House kind of thing. And, and I, I was so looking forward, for so many reasons, for Hillary to win because it would force the Republicans again to try for comprehensive immigration. But now that they won, they, they, they don't need the Latino vote, or at least they think for now, because they won without the Latino vote this time, and without the black vote, and without the Asian vote. All righty. Thank you so much, everyone, Thank you. for those right. questions. Um, and let's give um, Professor Hing a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna take a quick 10 minute break and then we will be back at 4.40 um, for our roundtable panelists um, where you get to ask more questions um, and also uh, Professor Hing will also join the, the panelists towards the end uh, during Q&A so you can get to ask more questions as well. Yes, thank you. Alrighty, I hope break was good definitely need it. Um, so it is, we're gonna move on now to our roundtable panelist discussion and the way that it'll work is each of our three panelists uh, will come up uh, one at a time, of course, 
Um, and they'll give a brief 15, 20 minutes uh, presentation, and then we'll have an open discussion, Q&A, with uh, the three panelists and uh, Professor Hing as well, uh, between the audience and the panelists, and also uh, between the panelists them themselves as well, if they would like to ask each other questions. <clears throat> It is with great pleasure that I introduce to you our expert panelists this uh, afternoon, and I ask that you hold the applause till the very end. Lilia Fernandez is a Henry Rutgers Term Chair Associate Professor in Latino and Caribbean Studies and the Department of History at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. Lilia Fernandez attains her PhD in Ethnic Studies from UC San Diego. Her research interests include US Latino history, immigration, race and identity, urban renewal and gentrification, women's history and urban education. Her groundbreaking book, Brown in the Windy City, Mexicans and Puerto Ricans in Post-War Chicago, was released in 2012 and is the first history to examine the migration of these two ethnic groups to Chicago. In her work, she discusses the social and economic changes that took place in the urban north in the mid 20th century, such as declining industrial employment and massive urban renewal projects and how Mexicans and Puerto Ricans navigated these dynamics to claim their own geographic and racial space in the city. Fernandez is currently working on two edited projects, an interdisciplinary volume on Mexican Americans outside the US Southwest, and an encyclopedia, 50 Events That Shapes Latino History. Fernandez serves on a number of editorial and advisory boards for journals like Aslan, Latino Studies, and the Journal of American Ethnic Studies, History. In 2015, she joined the editorial board for the Historical Studies in Urban America series at the University of Chicago Press. Laura Baraclau is an associate professor of American Studies and Ethnicity, Race, and Migration, where she teaches courses about cities, geography, race, and ethnicity, and immigration. She receives her PhD in American Studies and Ethnicity from the University of Southern California. Her scholarship integrates archival, ethnographic, and spatial analyses of urban life and culture. She is the author of Making the San Fernando Valley, Rural Landscapes, Urban Development, and White Privilege, which is the first history of LA's iconic suburb. suburb. And with Laura Polito and Wendy Chang, Baraclau authors A People's Guide to Los Angeles, an alternative tourist guidebook that highlights sites of racial, gender, sexual, labor, and environmental struggle in LA's vernacular landscapes. She has also been working on several shorter projects related to race, immigration, and urbanization across the American West. And she engages in public history uh, initiatives on these same themes, notably as co-editor co of the New People's Guide book series with UC Press. She's currently working on a book project that investigates the production of ethnic Mexican masculinity and immigrant illegality through Charreria Mexican Rodeo in the US Southwest. Articles from that project have recently been published in Aslan, a journal of Chicano studies and ethnic and racial studies. Leah Perry is assistant professor of cultural studies at SUNY Empire State College. Perry receives her PhD from George Mason's University Cultural Studies program, a master's of arts from New York University in humanities and social thought, and a second master's of arts in religion from Yale Divinity School. Her research and teaching interests encompass gender and sexuality, American studies, immigration, race and ethnicity, and media and popular culture. Perry is the author of The Cultural Politics of US Immigration, Gender, Race, and Media, where she argues that 1980s immigration discourse in law and po popular media was a crucial ingredient in the cohesion of the neoliberal idea of democracy. Examining the relationship between law and culture, Perry's book weaves questions of legal status and gender into existing discussions about race and ethnicity to revise her understanding of both neoliberalism and immigration. Her work can also be seen in journals such as Cultural Studies in, ooh, I'm sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> her work can also be seen in journals such as Cultural Studies in Lateral, and in, the book and in book collections, Cultural Studies and the Juridical Turn, Culture, Law, and legit Legitimacy in the Era of Neoliberal Capitalism, and American Shame, Stigma, and the Body Politic. She currently serves the American Studies Association as co-chair of the Committee on Gender and Sexuality Studies. Perry has recently received a Fulbright Scholar Award to teach in Hungary in 2017-2018. And with that, please help me introduce our panelists this afternoon.
good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank um, Yalidi Matos, uh, Professor Tricia Rose, uh, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in the Americas, and um, all the staff and uh, sponsors that helped to make this event possible. So thank you very much. It's really wonderful to be here today. So when I was contacted and asked to speak on this panel on uh, the 1965 Immigration Act, I thought that uh, what, would, what I would do is talk a little bit about uh, the 65 Immigration Act and, and placing it in a historical context. So I'm not going to be talking about my own research today, but um, thinking about how uh, the 65 law really um, can be seen as a starting point for understanding our modern immigration system. Uh, there are various landmark laws or um, policies that historians point to as the founding moment of the modern uh, the immigration system that we've lived with for the last several decades. Uh, but the 65 law, I would say, is as good as any, um, as the 1924 Johnson-Reed Act, uh, the Bracero Program, or uh, uh, subsequent laws after 65 to explain the dynamics that we see in the country today. So I should mention uh, that uh, Laura Barclow and I were on a panel together on this very same topic at the Urban History Association's conference this past fall in October uh, in Chicago. Although our focus there was on uh, the 1965 law and cities, how the Immigration uh, Act had an impact on um, urban areas, uh, the metropolis in, uh, in the US. So as we discussed there, uh, and as a number of scholars know, the 65 law was in many ways a liberalizing policy because it did away with the national origins quotas that had been in place since 1921 and then since 1924. However, it was liberalizing only in regards to European immigrants and to Asian immigrants. In the case of immigrants from the Western Hemisphere, that is from Mexico, Latin America, um, and we could say Canada um, as well, the law actually for the very first time established numerical quotas for uh, immigrants coming from these countries. So we need to think about it in uh, different terms when we think about uh, Mexican immigration and particularly immigration from Latin America and the Caribbean. It appeared, of course, at the end of the Bracero program, uh, which had already conditioned Mexican labor to circulate through a temporary migrant labor circuit uh, to the US and back uh, to Mexico. And it also appeared in the midst of an ongoing illegal immigration crisis, as it was being described at that time. So I point this out to remind us that the fear, the um, anxiety that we're seeing today, the nativism, the xenophobia, and of course our uh, reaction to it is, um, is not new. We've seen waves of this before in the past. Um, I was glad to see Professor Ying um, mention the Palmer raids, for example, the uh, deportation of Mexicans during the Great Depression, uh, and uh, again during the mid-1950s in the midst of the Bracero program, which actually had increased uh, unauthorized immigration to a great extent. So one of the dangers of uh, talking about uh, these issues or bringing together a, a round table on immigration issues is that we often end up preaching to the choir, right? We all seem to, uh, tend to have a, a or in general agreement about our opposition to anti-immigrant politics. We all understand the need uh, that uh, people have in coming to the United States. So I thought that what I would do uh, today in um, the few minutes I have is to get down to the nitty gritty and look at some of the statistics and um, data to help us understand what in fact has been going on uh, and why. Before I, um, I get to some of that, however, let me uh, provide a little bit more context here in terms of how this uh, Immigration Act, uh, when it appeared and what it did and didn't do. Um, we know, of course, because of the Bracero program, because of uh, the ongoing circulation of Mexican labor during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s to the US, that there was a high demand for this labor in the country. And uh, we have to remember as well that 
part of the decision to end the Bracero program was, included the creation of the border industrialization program on the Mexican side of the border, meant to address uh, economic need and the demand for migration uh, from Mexican workers. This, however, would not be an effective policy. Essentially, uh, the border industrialization program summoned the wage labor of a segment of the population that had not participated in paid labor outside of the home traditionally at very high rates, women. The maquiladoras that were uh, created along the border uh, uh, employed primarily young women and thus did not address the need at all for male employment in the Mexican labor market. Uh, although it did, if we wanted to look at this in positive terms, did open up industrial employment for women, right? something that had been foreclosed in the past. And this, of course, occurred at the same time that runaway uh, plants, uh, manufacturing plants and industry were leaving the urban north, going south uh, both in the U.S. and then overseas, but also uh, uh, a period when manufacturing began to um, undergo automation and mass mechanization. So in other words, the demand for that kind of industrial labor was declining anyway um, at this same time. And apart from Mexico and the border industrialization program there, of course, Latin America would see a similar economic development strategies during this time. In political conditions in Latin America, the very ones that would achieve the economic objectives of U.S. and multinational corporations to create similar industrialization schemes in the Caribbean and Central America. Think here uh, export processing zones or EPZs that were created in the Dominican Republic and um, many other places. Again, drawing on women's labor, but at wages that did not do much to raise uh, families out of poverty. Uh, created social turmoil, dislocations, and other forms of unrest that exacerbated conditions and economic need in these countries and therefore prompted increasing flows of migrants at this very moment, okay, after the um, 65 law. Now, as um, Yalili mentioned in the introduction, I've been uh, working on this uh, encyclopedia project and uh, have a number of uh, authors who've been submitting their entries to me, and I've been learning a whole lot about a lot of these laws and these policies and um, much more detail than, than I had known uh, before. And uh, in reading the entry on the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act, I discovered that, in fact, uh, some scholars have argued that one of the provisions of the 1965 law, which was to have a, uh, establish a preference for family reunification, is, in fact, uh, blamed by some uh, some scholars point to that as the cause for uh, increased backlogs in visa application processing today. In other words, this has exacerbated the uh, problem of undocumented immigration by making it more difficult from immigrants from Mexico specifically, but also from India and China to immigrate legally. So I wanted to turn to that first and take you to uh, a website that uh, an immigration lawyer uh, taught me about uh, some years ago um, as I taught immigration history courses at Ohio State. And that is the, um, you know, when people talk about immigration, uh, about uh, um, illegal immigration and say, why don't they just get to the back of the line and immigrate legally like everyone else does? Why can't these people just follow the rules and do what they're supposed to? Well, what um, is rather interesting and what I did not realize uh, you know, exactly until uh, I was uh, introduced to this, is that that line is incredibly long. And we, as most Americans, we, uh, most Americans don't really understand uh, how long that line is. So if you go to the US uh, Department of State's travel website, you can uh, get per diem rates if you're looking for a reimbursement from the <laughs> university. <laughs> Learn about how to get your passport. But if you're someone who's trying to enter the United States and get a visa, you might go here to the visa bulletins. Okay, oh, they're asking for my feedback. No, thank you. Uh, you might go to the visa bulletin page and uh, find this. 
Every month, the State Department uh, issues these bullet, uh, visa bulletins, which tell you, uh, give you some detail about the visa processing schedule. So, if you scroll down, this here gives you an explanation about statutory numbers, and Professor Hing probably is much more familiar with this than I am and knows all the inner workings, but I wanted to take us to this section on family-sponsored preferences, which again was one of the provisions of the 65 law that family members of U.S. citizens and uh, legal permanent residents would get priority as uh, potential immigrants uh, into the country. So if you fall into one of these pre uh, preferential categories, unmarried sons and daughters of U.S. citizens, that's category F1, remember that. Um, F2A, spouses and children of permanent residents. F2B, unmarried sons and daughters who are 21 or older, 21 years of age or older. And then F3, married sons and daughters of U.S. citizens. F4, brothers and sisters of U.S. citizens. All right, so those are the different categories. Now, if you go down to the table and see, uh, look at the schedule here, what this tells us is for all areas of the world, with the exception of these four countries, China, India, Mexico, and the Philippines, if you want to qualify to enter the United States under an F1 category, you need to have applied uh, by October 10, 2015. So about a year and a half backlog, right, uh, to get your application process. However, you notice over here that if you're coming from Mexico, and you fall into this pref preferential category of F1 or F2B uh, or F3, for example, you need to have applied, um, oh, I'm, I apologize, I, let me go back. I misread this. This, I think, is 2010 for, for um, all other areas. So there's a, a longer backlog there. But for Mexico, it goes all the way back to 1995. So. This explains, when I show my students this, they're completely stunned. This explains why so many people come without authorization. Because in order to get in, I mean, the line is 22 years long. In order to get a legal um, visa or some kind of permit to come to the United States, you need to have applied 22 years ago. And this, again, is only if you fall into one of these preferential categories. If you don't have family who are already US citizens or um, uh, permanent uh, resident uh, aliens in the US, then your chances are even slimmer. Okay. So, so that's the back of the line, essentially. And that helps to explain why uh, so many people uh, essentially come without papers. Now, we know that uh, Mexicans con constitute about 65%, I think, maybe um, some estimates are higher, of the undocumented population, however, uh, one of the things that we uh, tend to overlook is the fact that they have primarily been the focus of um, deportation, of uh, uh, immigration regulation, much more than immigrants from other countries. And uh, one of the things that I think the 65 law helps us to uh, talk about and understand is the way in which this modern day Im, um, deportation apparatus has really grown over the 20th century. So if we look, for example, at data from uh, the Yearbook of Immigration Statistics from uh, ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or the INS before uh, uh, the agency's name change, you see the number of deportable aliens that ha were located by immigration services over the 20th century, beginning in 1925. Now, if you look decade by decade, however, and I'm gonna bring up these little red squares so you can read this a little more clearly. From 1941 to 1950, for example, 1.3 million, almost 1.4 million deportable aliens were located. From 1951 to 60, the decade before the 65 law was passed, uh, almost 3.6 million, from 61 to 70, 1.6 million. Look at the numbers prior to this and you see that they were much, much smaller, from 25 to 30, uh, 31 to 40. Now, if we continue from 1971 to 1980, after these, this supposed liberal uh, immigration act of 65, uh, you see that number skyrockets to 8.3 million. From uh, in the 80s, it went, uh, went up to 11.8 million. In the 90s, 14.7 million, um, just about. 
And then in the first four decades of uh, the new millennium, 4.7 million. If we focus just on the data from that 2004 year, you see the total number of uh, deportable aliens located, which was about what it was 1.2 million. And then you see the breakdown by country, and I, I don't expect you to be able to read any of this, but you can just get a sense that these figures are pretty small, right? They're single digits, double digits coming from places like Belarus, Belgium, Croatia, the Czech Republic, um, Macedonia, uh, Serbia, et cetera. But, um, let me go back for a second. So that total number was 1.2 million. If you look at the figures for North America, specifically Mexico, you see that almost that entire number is uh, deportable aliens from Mexico. So in other words, ICE is focusing on immigrants specifically from Mexico and to a less extent other Latin American uh, regions like Central America, 62,000 people. If we look at aliens returned by region and country, now these, these numbers are from 2009 to 2014. Again, here are the total numbers, 582,000 in 2009, um, a decline after that to 2014, about 162,000 people who were returned. But once again, if we look at North America, knowing that the majority of those are from Mexico, not Canada, which is the only other North American country. Again, you see that it's Mexican immigrants who are bearing the brunt of this kind of regulation and uh, removal. Now, the good news, um, I think, if, you know, in all of this, or one of the things that I think we, we need to take into consideration is that at moments of uh, tremendous uh, anti-immigrant rhetoric, of nativism and xenophobia, we see that legal immigrants in the US respond by naturalizing at much higher rates. So you remember back in 2006, the Sensenbrenner Bill, the immigrant rights marches, uh, the, uh, you know, all the talk about immigration reform that never in fact came to pass well, if we look at the numbers of people that filed petitions to naturalize in those years, you see that they rose dramatically. From 2006, uh, 730,000 to 2007, uh, nearly doubling, 1.3 million people applied to uh, become US citizens. So I uh, you know, share this with you to offer us some hope that those who do have a uh, pathway to citizenship, those who do have access to becoming US citizens, uh, do take it up. Unfortunately, it's uh, often at moments of crisis, and uh, you know there are many, many people who get left out of this uh, process, but nonetheless, uh, it's important for us to consider. And I'm uh, just about out of time, right? So let me uh, just end with uh, two final things. And this is, um, I want to give credit where it's due. This comes from Professor Doug Massey, who many of you know is uh, one of the leading experts in immigration, particularly from Mexico, who uh, presented this a few years ago when he came to visit uh, at Ohio State, which is where I was previously before uh, going to Rutgers, uh, that really revealed, I think, uh, why it is that illegal immigration becomes such a rallying point for anti-immigrant rhetoric, why it becomes uh, such a hot topic and draws so much attention, so much anger. And he starts this feedback, what he calls the immigration feedback loop on the far left with unauthorized entries. We know that people enter the country uh, without papers, without documentation, although we know also that only 40% of illegal immigration comes across the US-Mexico border. Nonetheless, those people that come, some of them get apprehended. Okay? When this is in the public's view, when it's caught on television, on the news feeds, on you know, websites, uh, et cetera, social media, uh, this creates a tremendous amount of anti-immigrant reaction. So what does that do then? Well, that leads to people contacting their congressmen, complaining about all these illegals entering the country, 
uh, et cetera, and ultimately leads to restrictive legislation and more restrictive operations. In other words, the Border Patrol gets beefed up. There's a lot of talk about cracking down on illegal immigrants and you know, um, dealing with this problem. So this leads to more Border Patrol agents, more funding for the Border Patrol, and that, of course, results in increased line watch hours, as um, they're called. More people at the front lines watching and, and uh, looking for undocumented immigrants. So it's not surprising then that if there are more people they're monitoring, if we've got militarized equipment uh, uh, in this uh, process as well, that then as those unauthorized entries continue, more of them are apprehended, and this continues this uh, loop over and over again. So I think that we need to uh, talk as well as, as we talk about the issue of um, you know, what is happening now uh, on, in this Trump era uh, under this new administration and all of the uh, uh, anti-immigrant sentiment that he's mobilized. Uh, although I will re remind us that, uh, as I, someone mentioned the other day at a presentation that I attended, only 26% of eligible voters in the United States voted for Donald Trump. Okay. So as much as he likes to think that he's gotten this mandate from the nation, that Americans are all you know, riled up ab about illegal immigration and, and want him to do something about it, only 26% of all eligible voters put him into office. Nonetheless, I want to end with um, with a tangible example, you know, as uh, Professor Ying was talking about the fear and whether or not we are uh, fomenting too much of it in um, having these conversations about Trump and about the impact that uh, his potential policies might have. Um, I think it's important to historicize these moments in the past, but I think we do see some very real concrete examples of the effect this is having. And so I wanted to um, share something with you, if I could get, uh, something that I, came across this morning uh, at 5 a.m. when I woke up and, and checked my Facebook feed, which I haven't been doing a lot of lately, but which um, nonetheless I think was very uh, timely uh, and heartbreaking too. And, and this points to the link between the issue of uh, undocumented immigration and the whole health care issue that's been going on right now with um, the Affordable Care Act and, and all of that. This is um, the sister of a dear friend of mine who uh, posted this, uh, actually from yesterday morning. She said, today is a sad day. My father-in-law will be transported to Mexico from Chicago by the hospital. He is undocumented and uninsured. He had a brain injury that left him unable to function. There is no justice, there is no peace. Health care continues to be for those that can afford it. The struggle is real. The struggle continues. Heartbroken. When I read this, it really touched me because um, you know I haven't met uh, this woman's um, father-in-law, and yet she captures for us right now at this very moment what is so urgent about the impact that these policies are having and that this rhetoric is having for um, people like her father-in-law. But. Um, it also gives us more reason to uh, continue to uh, strategize and think of ways to uh, combat uh, the nativism, the xenophobia, and what may be coming ahead. And hopefully also energizes us to continue teaching our students and talking to one another about these issues. So thank you. How's everyone doing? Thank you for being here. It's the cranky hour, as my five-year-old would say. Um, so I'm glad that you all are here. Um, thanks to everyone for putting this event together. Um, I want to start by situating myself. I should put that like on, right? Thank you. I think that one. It's that one. Thank you, Kate. Um, I want to start by situating myself in relationship to our conversation. I'm trained primarily as an urbanist and a historical and cultural geographer. 
Um, and so what that means is that in my research and teaching, I'm really interested in the spatiality of inequality and how the kinds of, um, so for today I'll be thinking about how questions of citizenship and belonging around race, migration status, ethnicity, gender, um, and class are negotiated in the ways that people organize physical space and are constantly producing and transforming the landscapes, and in particular the ordinary landscapes and the vernacular landscapes that we pass through and are producing every day. Um, so I'm gonna start today by outlining some of the broad trends that scholars have been talking about in both urban history and cultural geography and highlighting some of the areas of research and practice that I think are really exciting and innovative. And then I'll, um, uh, in the second part of my comments, share with you some of the research that I've been doing which is about how Mexican migrants remember the rural past in order to exercise belonging and agency um, in the city. So um, to start, oh, and I should say too that my expertise is primarily in Los Angeles and the Southwest, um, cities like San Antonio, Denver, Pueblo, Colorado, et cetera. So I'll be drawing most of my examples from that region. Um, so as a result of transformations in the 1965 Immigration Act, as well as the broad uh, policy changes that Lilia um, outlined for us, Contemporary migrants are continuing, as we know, to arrive in the nation's traditional immigrant gateway cities, um, New York, Los Angeles, San Francisco, et cetera, just as they have been doing for decades. And of course, they're maintaining complex, um, dynamic, but also uh, complicated communities there. What's unique about the urban existence in this moment, as, again, as Lilia referred to, is that immigrants have, in fact, been staving off the very worst of economic restructuring in these places um, and contributing to facil and facilitating urban and regional economic restructuring. So migrants have been especially important presences in places that have experienced the, the kind of the twin uh, dynamos of deindustrialization or the decline of manufacturing and mass suburbanization of people and capital and other kinds of fiscal and human resources to the suburbs. Um, and so that's, of course, pretty much all cities in the United States. And so migrants have been really, really important in these places in injecting their labor power, their financial investments, small and large, and their cultural practices, as well as the ways that they are producing space. Um, so this fact has led some analysts who focus on Latino migrants to refer to this phenomenon that some of you may have heard of called the Latino New Urbanism. Um, so briefly, the idea is that Latinos and, and especially Latin American migrants are said to use and experience neighborhoods and public spaces in ways that revitalize cities. How do I make this go forward? There we go. Can I just do that? Okay. Um, so for example, many immigrants tend to live close to where they work. They tend to walk and bike at disproportionate rates rather than drive and take the bus, of course, too. They buy and sell informally on the street. They make ample use of front porches, sidewalks, public parks, and plazas and other public spaces. Um, so much of this activity has revitalized formerly declining urban neighborhoods, of course, in ways that also have paved the way for gentrification. A lot of analysts say that this this kind of spatial practice um, draws in some way upon migrants' previous origins in Latin American countries, which tend to have a more robust public sphere in many, in many cases than um, in Los Angeles. But other critics have noted that the, this Latino new urbanism, to the extent that it exists, is not a, in it really a pure feature of Latin American culture. Instead, in the United States, these patterns in the use of urban space are better seen as the result of poverty and structural discrimination in the labor market, as well as the exclusionary policies adopted in many states and localities that prohibit migra undocumented migrants from um, obtaining driver's license or residing in public housing. And so those kinds of structural features are, are a major reason why we end up having these kinds of spatial dynamics present in our landscape. Nor have Latin American migrants' alleged new urbanist practices gone uncontested. Um, in her study of Latino migration to Northwest Arkansas, and specifically the small city of Fort Smith, there's a very cute small child out there. Um, Bella Guerrero, my friend, <laughs> see, two of them, oh, there's two, okay, I'm sorry. Um, has found that Latino ways of using space, the same kinds of practices that I've just described and that you can see in these images here, have provoked immense resistance and hostility from white neighbors. Um, who then, who complain about how Latino migrants are allegedly too loud, invite too many people to their parties, too active in their use of the front porch instead of the backyard like normal people. This is a quote from Guerrero's work. These are the very practices that are allegedly revitalizing cities and yet white neighbors in these places often call upon the police to uh, call, call these uh, practices into question. And Guerrero is referring to this process and these acts of policing as spatial illegality. 
the marking of Latinos as threatening subjects who lack rights and do not belong in this case because of how, when, and where they're using physical space. Despite um, all of this debate about gentrification, the Latino new urbanism, and spatial illegality, the migrant presence has not been wholly or even primarily an urban one. In fact, one of the most impactful effects of our current immigration policy since 65 is its impacts on uh, suburban space. This is in large part due to the 1965 Hart Seller Act's prioritization of highly skilled and well capitalized migrants uh, who can either fill labor shortages at the top levels of the US economy or can create new jobs and investment opportunities. This is a second set of, of priorities in addition to the family reunification categories that Lilia Fernandez highlighted for us. So this class of migrants include people with capital to invest and the cultural and spatial tastes to match. So these people don't want to live in ethnic enclaves, and they don't. Um, they want to live in elite suburbs. They drive Mercedes and BMWs instead of riding bikes or taking the bus. And these folks have been creating what geographer Wei Li is referring to as the ethnoburb, a globally connected, ethnically identified suburb inhabited by highly educated, upper middle class, and wealthy migrants. The identities of these people, and it, tend, it has tended so far to be most often Chinese, becomes widely visible in the commercial landscape, for example, through the proliferation of high-end restaurants, luxury auto dealers, upscale retail, and professional offices like some of those that you see here. But one notable feature of the ethnoburb is that it, con it continues to be inhabited by other ethnic um, and racial groups, including white folks. Because the Chinese migrants are wealthy and influential, the fact of their presence hasn't necessarily spurred white flight to the same degree. And as a result, the politics of belonging in ethnoburbs and other ethnically integrating suburbs tend to focus on questions of culture that are negotiated in large part through the landscape. For example, for white US born citizen homeowners who have lived disproportionately in suburban neighborhoods, um, and those same neighborhoods are now experiencing ethnic or racial change, Efforts to preserve historically exclusive landscapes have really abounded since the 1960s. And of course, this is a, a broad area of scholarship. But some of the things that I would highlight include efforts to pass English-only ordinances in commercial signage so that these kinds of uh, characters, the Chinese characters, would be outlawed. Um, other things that have been used are environmental laws and policies and historic preservation zoning ordinances, which um, seem on their face to be progressive, but which in fact have had the effect of curtailing migration by large numbers of middle class or upper middle class migrants to these places. Nonetheless, migrants find creative ways to negotiate those kinds of restrictions and to claim belonging. James Sarsa Diaz, who's a scholar of Asian American Studies and Urban Studies at the University of San Francisco, has shown that Chinese migrants to wealthy and exclusive suburbs often engage in what he calls design assimilation in an article that he co-authored with Becky Nicolaitis last year. So in other words, uh, these wealthy Chinese migrants are not producing these kinds of landscapes, but instead are engaging in highly strenuous efforts to uphold the existing landscapes of white exclusivity. Hold on. Whether that's the rustic uh, ranch style homes of country living suburbs, or the Tudor manors and English gardens of elite places like um, suburbia, so and like San Marino in California. So both of these places are um, Asian majority suburbs, and you wouldn't necessarily know it. These are very different kinds of places than the ethnoburb. White homeowners are not always convinced, however, and they have, in fact, continued to geographically reshuffle themselves in response. More bluntly, white flight, uh, which I think we need to think of as a spatial reorganization of whiteness, is continuing. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, demographer William Frey found that large numbers of working class and middle class whites left immigrant gateway cities on the coasts in large numbers. Overwhelmingly, they settled in the interior of the country, which they referred to in ethnographic and journalistic accounts as the heartland of America, places that were imagined to retain traditional American values and didn't seem as directly threatened by migration. And in some cases, these white migrants, especially those from California who left in, at the height of Prop 187, went on to establish anti-immigrant organizations in their new rural Midwestern and Southern locales. And they claimed leadership roles through their experiences of dealing with immigrants in places like California, New York, New Jersey, et cetera, and Florida. 
So this is a demographic that's not often talked about, probably, in all the discourse on rural voters in Trump's America, but I think we should remember that not all of these people have always been rural. Some of them are urban in origin, and some of them um, claim to have a lot of experience on that basis. Whether or not these white heartland migrants have gotten involved in immigration politics or not, their very presence has also been transforming rural America in some unexpected ways. Frequently, these folks are middle class information and tech workers who are working remotely um, through innovations in Skype and cheap airfare, et cetera. But because they come from these immigrant gateway cities, they actually expect urban and cosmopolitan amenities, which soon propels migration by the very people they were trying to escape, low wage, low skill service workers who work in coffee shops, et cetera. Um, so geographer Lise Nelson, who has been studying these dual migration streams, refers to this as uh, rural gentrification. And following her lead, I think it's productive to consider how these macro-scale economic changes intersect with immigration policy to also restructure urban, suburban, and rural spaces simultaneously and in relationship to each other. And so here I'm gonna um, switch to talk about my current research, which is trying to do just that. Um, in, in all of my research, I am considering how ideas, fantasies, and historical experiences with rural land affect the way that people engage with cities, with urban landscapes, and urban culture. And today I want to speak from um, my current book project, which I'm currently wrapping up. It's called Charro City, Mexican-American Urbanism Beyond the Barrio, and it'll be published by the University of California Press next year. So the book that I'm going to finish any day um, looks at how Mexican migrants and Mexican-Americans in the Southwest have organized around the figure of the charro, which translates roughly as gentleman cowboy. Um, he's most visible, this figure, in the suits worn by mariachis, but he's much more than that. He's a deeply Mexican nationalist figure who brings together colonial histories of Spanish uh, ranching and the hacienda with independent Mexican nationalism and performances of elite masculinity, all of which coheres in this suit, in these performances of Mexican rodeo events, and in the physical landscapes um, and memories attached to both the hacienda and the rancho. For Mexican migrants in the United States as early as the 1930s, but really taking off in the 1970s, performing as charros has been a really important way in which they've been um, claiming urban rights and belonging. This happens in a number of ways that I analyze in the book. One way is through the establishment of charro associations. These are formal organizations of 10 to 20 men who train and compete with each other in the Mexican rodeo circuit across the United States and Mexico. These groups are made up overwhelmingly of Mexican migrant men and their US-born sons and nephews. Um, since the 1900s, literally hundreds of these associations have been established in the United States, mostly in the Southwest, but also in Chicago, Washington State, Iowa, and other places. Uh, the association, this is an early photo of the, the Charo Association in Denver um, in 1972, and they, there's many, many more now. The associations host weekly competitions on Sundays, which are usually preceded by a Catholic mass and followed by a concert of banda or ranchera music. The events are attended by family members, uh, friends, neighbors, um, and other spectators, and they're really uh, notable for their mixed migrant statuses. A more temporary use of the landscape for similar purposes occurs through the staging of jaripeos, or bull riding events, which are often sponsored by entrepreneurial, but often very poorly capitalized, hold on, oh yeah, there's a contemporary competition, very poorly capitalized um, Latin-themed entertainment companies that are run by middle-class migrants who also own some other kind of small business, like a restaurant. So this is an advertisement from a company called Rodeo Tierra Caliente, which is run by a Mexican migrant named Miguel Guzman, who lives in the Bronx and founded this uh, promoting company in 1995. He runs a, a traveling circuit of bull riding events and concerts all throughout the Northeast region, including right here in Rhode Island, as well as in New Haven, where I live. These performances and competitions require appropriate physical space, and it's here where charros and event promoters like Guzman have led the remaking of the urban and sometimes suburban landscape. So charro associations have built lienzos, or complexes of arenas and stables that are deliberately um, meant to house the specific events of the Mexican rodeo in cities and suburbs all across the US, like this one in San Antonio. Some of these are privately owned, uh, in cases where middle-class Mexican migrants have acquired a bit of land and then have constructed um, facilities like this through their own labor. But in other cases, ethnic Mexican men have worked closely with municipal governments 
to finance, construct, lease, and use lienzos um, as part of a regional or transnational economic development strategy. And the best case of this is the Pico Rivera Sports Arena in eastern LA County, which is known across California and in Mexico as one of the premier facilities for charro competitions, but also for concerts and other public events like swap meets. The landscapes established for the, the Jaripeo events like, that people like Guzman um, host are temporary, but they're no less interesting. So promoters set up these makeshift landscapes. I'm not sure if you can see it in the back, but this is a pipe corral that's tied together with twine. And people are sitting on folding chairs. Um, I'm not sure what this lot is. This is in Maryland. Um, and so in, in this way, this is, uh, you know, they'll, they'll haul in some rented uh, bulls or steers set them up in some pipe corrals and then haul them back out in trailers for the afternoon. And so these are, are temporary places and yet they're often set up on industrial or post-industrial spaces in otherwise abandoned or unused urban areas. So there's many other ways in which the charro and, and ideas about the rural Mexican ranching past more broadly are, serve, are serving as resources for belonging um, for migrants in American cities. So the charro is the subject of innumerable short stories, poems, songs authored by Mexican immigrants and Mexican Americans. He's the subject of a reality TV show called Los Cowboys. Has anybody seen this show? It's actually pretty good. Um, it was on Hulu, it debuted in, on Hulu in 2015. It was bought by Univision and is now in its third season. So it seems to be doing well. And the charro has also informed many efforts to, to shape urban public art, especially statuary. Um, so most recently, this is a statue of Antonio Aguilar, who's a performer, singer, artist, activist, I'm sorry, not activist, actor, um, <laughs> who is most known for his corridos and, and folk songs um, that was just installed at, at Olvera Street in Los Angeles, which has been a kind of a tourist trap selling exotic ideas of ethnic Mexican um, uh, kind of stereotypes and caricatures. Um, and yet we have this nationalist figure um, who has been installed here as a statue. And the, the creation of this statue is especially significant when we consider that other efforts um, in other southwestern cities have been really contested. So for example, um, Gary Carava has written about all of the debate and consternation that surrounded um, the creation of this statue of Pancho Villa um, atop a horse in, in Tucson in the 1980s where city uh, leaders got so upset that they constructed another statue of a Spanish missionary, uh, Kino, which is meant to dominate the Villa statue. And in my own research, um, there's now this statue of a Mexican-American war veteran, Joe Martinez, in the Denver Civic Center, but this exact same spot was originally proposed for a charro statue to be outside of the um, Colorado State Legislature building by two Chicano congresspeople in the 1980s. That effort totally failed, and so we got a war veteran instead, which I think tells us a lot about what kinds of images and icons of Mexican identity are considered acceptable, at least in that kind of civic landscape. So as this last effort um, shows us and the struggle around that, the use of the charro in the rural imaginary as a way to claim belonging and shape landscapes has never been uncontested. And yet migrants' ongoing performances as charros, their building of lienzos, their hosting of jaripeos, and their occasional uh, successes in influencing public art are all important ways in which they're using ideas about the rural past to affect landscapes and to transform the landscapes um, in the name of re-territorializing a Mexican presence in the United States. Um, and in that case, I think it's just one more example of the ways that the landscape can really be thought of productively as the, the ordinary and everyday ways that people are engaging with the same kinds of discourses that we hear so often in the media. Thank you. Hi, now for something kind of different. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot about the, the 1986 immigration law um, and pop culture. And so I'm just gonna go for it. Um, although he may seem like an over the top anomaly, uh, Trump's racist, sexist, violent, anti-immigration rhetoric and policy actually developed from bipartisan immigration discourse established in the 1980s. So I'm arguing that it's the 80s is, although the 65 is, is also important, um, but I'm saying that, that the 80s is the moment where we see these particularities that he's engaged in, or some of these particularities. 
Um, so, Trump's racist, sexist, violent, anti-immigration rhetoric and policy actually developed from bipartisan immigration discourse established in the 1980s in response to the civil rights and second wave feminist movements. That immigration discourse is integral to the neoliberal idea of democracy. I talk about the, the various threads of this in my book. Um, today, I'm gonna focus on the criminalization thread. So, the 1983 Genesis song and video for Illegal Alien, and these are stills from that video, uh, with its refrain, it's no fun being an illegal alien, supposedly a light satire about the struggles of undocumented immigrants, flagrantly played up stereotypes of Mexicans. Even the popular press, and this was in the 1980s, the popular press in the 80s said that it was racist. In the 80s. Um, it's rarely played on radio. The lyrics delivered by white vocalist Phil Collins in a Mexican accent describe Mexican laziness, drinking, tequila, of course, smoking, use of illegal economies for documentation, and sordid women. In the video, set in a barrio in Mexico, Collins and his white bandmates are coded as Mexican. They drink, oversleep, play mariachi music, dance with produce, that's what's happening there, <laughs> fight at the passport office and commit passport fraud. In the final stanza, the speaker appeals directly to nation of immigrants ideology, that is, the notion that the United States is an exceptionally diverse, inclusive, and abundant nation that is made of immigrants from all over the world. But the striving Im immigrant's plea for compassion is delegitimized by its criminal tendencies. <clears throat> there is the promise of gendered crime if, this, if he makes it into the promised land. His assumption that America will take care of him is a proxy for nativist fears that the undocumented exploit the welfare system. The couplet about exchanging his sister's sexual favors for passage over the border is a proxy for fears that the undocumented are amoral enemies of family values. It was so controversial that it was edited out of the song. Collins Mexican is the wrong kind of immigrant for the nation of immigrants. Many celebrate the Reagan era as a great time when America was prosperous and abundant. In truth, neoliberalism solidified in the 1980s with the dismantling of the welfare state. Neoliberalism's simultaneous appropriation of multicultural and feminist discourses and deployment of ostensibly color and gender blind appeals to protect certain citizens from crime and criminals either concealed or rationalized its inherent violence. Grace Hong pointed out that neoliberalism is a structure of disavowal. It claims that protected life is available to all and that premature death comes only to those whose criminal actions and poor choices make them deserve it. Affect is, which tells us, is what tells us which lives should not be protected. So I argue that legal status and the gendered racialized affect mobilized around it negated, circumscribed, and for a select few facilitated immigrant homemaking in the US. This analysis shows how the nexus of gender, race, and legal status structure neoliberalism. Now, some context. When Genesis released Illegal Alien, Congress was in the middle of a heated five-year debate over immigration, that ref immigration reform that culminated with the passing of the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, which, IRCA. These are the four major things that it did, or five. Um, pundits claimed the country was having an illegal immigration crisis, but demographics were just shifting. U.S. policies such as INA's loosening of direct racial restrictions and emphasis on family reunification, a new Western Hemisphere quota, austerity measures in Latin America and Central America that necessitated migration despite that new quota, and more domestic and service sector jobs led to increased immigration and the increased immigration of women from Central and Latin America, Asia, and the Caribbean. With these variables and against the backdrop of an economic depression and widespread unemployment in the 1970s, the term illegal alien became affixed to Mexicans and extended to Latinas. The criminalization of immigrants has always been gendered and racialized in relation to the demands of capital and political context. Reagan era crimmigration, a term which points to how, and this is a quote, immigration control was increasingly adopting the practices and priorities of the criminal justice system responded to the gains of multiculturalism and second wave feminism and changing immigration demog demographics with an intensified policing of the nation and the neighborhood as the exclusive home of certain groups who played by gendered and racialized rules. Persons of Latin American descent were cast as guilty of what Lisa Cacho calls a de facto status crime. That is, under neoliberalism, race and racialized spaces make certain bodies and act actions le legible as criminal and crimes. The person's status is itself the offense, carrying the assumption of future crime, 
Collins a Mexican and his salacious sister, always already illegal, did not deserve to be protected light. But in the 1980s, sentiment over immigration was not unified. Free market economists supported immigration not for humanitarian re reasons like some Democrats and activist groups, but because cheap immigrant la labor was profitable. Organized labor worried about labor competition and nativists charged that immigrants threatened the economy, culture, complexion, and safety of the United States. The Mariel Boatlift added a layer of urgency. At the same time, a new nation of immigrants national imaginary that recast white ethnic immigrants as ideal, self-sufficient, hardworking, family-oriented Americans was becoming hegemonic. This supposedly inclusive narrative, part of the mainstreaming of multiculturalism and feminism, was crucial to the United States' appearance as a humanitarian haven in the context of the Cold War. It also incorporated a few people of color, model minorities, who contributed to the economy and had proper family values. Moreover, the nation of immigrants narrative is entirely predicated on the erasure of slavery and indigenous genocide and people. The US is a settler colonial nation and many immigrants themselves became settlers. Now, some people in the room may remember some of these shows, um, but all these shows with these lovable immigrant characters were proliferating um, and more often than not, the lovable immigrant character was white ethnic um, from Eastern or Southern European and then these very highly respectable um, Im immigrants of color, the model minorities also was a thing that was prol proliferating. So there's that. Reagan's conservative supporters also wanted to get tough on crime, particularly through the war on drugs, another piece of this neoliberal puzzle. From its official start in 1982, which happens to be the same year that IRCA was first proposed, how about that? Inter international intervention, stricter criminal penalties, and increased incarceration were presented as urgent and necessary. Reagan blamed the war on drugs on communist governments in Latin America and poor people of color in inner city communities. The combination of the neoconservative trumpeting of family values and the notion of a racialized crime epidemic provided the effective support for the backlash against civil rights and feminist gains and underscoring the dismantling of the welfare state. America was allegedly in moral decline, epitomized by the breakdown of the nuclear family. This rearticulation of racism and sexism translated seamlessly into immigration policy and pop culture. What emerged was a discordant combination of gatekeeping and welcoming that made immigration crucial to neoliberalism. These two concepts of immigration, nation of immigrants and immigration emergency, surfaced repeatedly in relation to Latinos, Asians, and white ethnics beginning in the Reagan years and continued to be the dominant modes of thought and expression about immigration until September 11th brought terror and Islamophobia to the forefront of immigration politics. Though things have not changed all that much as we have seen. Um, comparing how Latinos, Asians, and white ethnics were represented in immigration discourse shows that even while multicultural immigrants were embraced, in some ways they were disciplined through gender discourses of respectability that became central to neoliberalism. So in navigating all these variables, IRCA established this paradigm for neoliberal immigration. Amnesty was dressed up as Reagan era nation of immigrants exceptional inclusivity, but this new program for temporary labor importation was what May Nye is called imported colonialism. The punitive provisions were framed as necessary for the safety of Americans and to avoid making the US, um, and this is a quote, the sugar daddy of the world. As Republican Senator Alan Simpson, IRCA's primary sponsor, eloquently put it, he also lobbied very hard in the first two iterations of IRCA to eliminate the family reunification provisions that allowed more Latino and Asian immigrants to come in. He wanted those gone. And it didn't pass, but he lobbied hard. Um, and if you're wondering just how racist and sexist America is, um, a look at the congressional record <laughs> makes it abundantly clear. Um, because that is a quote from the congressional record directly. And that's one of his more milder, more milder things that he said. Um, so part of neoliberal restructuring is an increasing militarism and securitization at national borders as they become more permeable with capital and labor. This is what IRCA did. Accordingly, the number of crossing-related deaths grew. In 1994, 23 migrants died. After Operation Gatekeeper, there were 61 deaths in 1995, 89 in 1997, and 145 in 1998. And Dr. Hingen probably he talked about that as well and could probably elaborate on it. 
Like the Texas Rangers, the newly beefed up border control used gendered brutality and rape as a means of immigration control. Studies undertaken in the 90s found that the sexual abuse and assaults of women was rampant and rarely reported, let alone prosecuted. Women were routinely pressured to remain silent and accused of lying when they did come forward. As feminist scholars have observed, casting a woman as sexually deviant because of her race, her profession, behavior, legal status, what she is wearing, renders her unrapeable, a logic that erases the systemic, intersectional nature of violence. Being illegal likewise makes violence against one invisible or rationalizes, rationalizes it. Also central to the criminalization of undocumented immigrants was the casting of Latino, and that is immigrant or citizen, family and gender arrangements as not only dysfunctional, but dangerous deviations from family values. So enter in pop culture again. In the 1980s, border films, crime dramas, and music videos worked in tandem with immigration policy and policing. Hollywood neoliberalized the stereotype of Latino criminality with stereotypes of narco-traficantes narco and drug dealers, criminals, bandits, gang members, and undocumented workers. Latinas found themselves as prostitutes in cantoneras. North of the border, Latinos were cast as the help, waiter, maid, bellhop, valet, or as criminal. Clara E. Rodriguez notes that the Hollywood staple of the Latino criminal began with the banditos in silent film and then in westerns, then moved to urban settings in the 1960s and the 1970s with images of juvenile delinquents, and continued in the 1980s and 1990s with gangs, criminals, and drug lords. The foreignness of the immigrant and Latino citizen often collapsed in the public imaginary, and in the execution of policy and in police procedure was conveyed via th their threats to family values. So I'm gonna give you a quick example. Colors, has anyone seen Colors? Okay. So, Colors, a 1988 crime drama directed by Dennis Hopper, um, and that's Dennis Hopper, Hopper doing something terrible with some of the actors from the film, um, was described favorably by viewers as a representation of the poisonous flowering of gang culture amid ghetto life, which captures a climate of fear and the helplessness of the police. It's a quote. Experienced police officer Bob Hodges, who is played by Robert Duvall, and novice Danny McGavin, played by Sean Penn, fight gang crime in LA barrios and are obvious Reaganite, Reaganite emblems of law and order and family values. Loving husband and new father Hodges is level-headed and compassionate, while the single hot-headed McGavin simmers down to fit the image of a benevolent patriarch. The gang members, all black or Latino, are economic and moral aliens. A Latino member of the blood gang who is high on drugs senselessly kills Hodges after the police apprehended the bloods without force. Gangbangers mortally threaten the American values of law-abiding and familial responsibility that Hodges embodies. McGavin's failed romance with the Latina likewise links Latinas to criminality through family values discourse. They are the support system, sexual objects, and accomplices of male gangbangers. Roger Ebert said that the gang was a perverted family that, given the lack of a traditional family, cared for, it, for members and was willing to die for them. Yet, the product of their family is, of course, tragic. Their gang deals in drugs, defends its turf, and murders to enforce its authority. This framing is always already racialized. Whites who commit crimes tend to be judged individually on the basis of their acts, rather than as representatives of an entire race. And like McGavin, who becomes the new moral of the Compass film, whites can evidently easily change for the better without rehabilitation or incarceration. But the people of color in the film, and in real life, are cast as intrinsically corrupt and beyond redemption. Latinos' true colors reaffirm the gender colored line, and invading foreign force violently threatens American reproductive respectability. But all ethnic crime films were not created equal. In U.S. cinema, white ethnics and especially Italian Americans have long been stereotyped and glamorized as mafia criminals. This gangster genre complements backlash against civil rights and feminist movements by idealizing white patriarchy. White ethnic men are depicted as members of a crime family who become involved with organized crime, a business venture, in order to provide their immigrant family with a better life. Here's that racist, sexist, settler nation of immigrants mythology. This is common sense reasoning for mobster activity that Reaganite America understood. 1980s discourse repackaged paradigms of gendered, racialized immigrant crime to conceal or justify neoliberal violence, establishing an enduring model for policy in popular media. And this is just some stuff that came from IRCA and that drew on IRCA. And by some stuff, I mean immigration. Law. <laughs> in conclusion, under neoliberal governance, punitive policies create a climate in which legal status widens the gaps between segments of the U.S. population, so that the undocumented immigrant becomes an affront to conventional notions of citizenship, 
which equate political, social, and civic rights with the criterion of legal residence. Racialized and gendered criminalization devalues certain immigrant and citizen lives. Furthermore, this narrow view of valuable immigrant life is prevalent in liberal and even progressive discourse that has taken up the nation of immigrants' narrative to counter the immigration emergency. Dream Act rhetoric asserts that immigrants deserve a path to legalization because they are law-abiding, especially hardworking members of heteronormative families, students, or have served in the military. Much opposition to the Muslim ban and ICE raids hinges on the nation of immigrants' imaginary. This makes me so uncomfortable, this hat. I don't know about anybody else. <laughs> As with the immigrants make America great slogan. Um, so much opposition to the, the Muslim ban and ICE raids hinges on nation of, the nation of immigrants' imaginary, as with the immigrants make America great slogan, recourse to the Statue of Liberty as the welcoming mother of exiles, the framing of welcoming immigrants as a national value, and the focus on the separation of hardworking families as an especially urgent reason to end the ban to deportations. These well-meaning narratives restrict the field for valuable immigrant life to reproductively respectable immigrants who contribute to the economy. Once again, this country's history and present of settler colonialism is erased, as are the racialized and gendered exclusions underpinning the nation of immigrants' narrative. So swing, swing back to the immigration emergency. Racialized anti-family behavior was the linchpin of the criminalization of the undocumented and Latinos. It was highly effective because of its affective appeal in the Reagan era, when the gains of feminism and multiculturalism threatened white supremacy and heteropatriarchy. Trump's successful xenophobic presidential campaign platform has called to build a wall at the Mexican border because they're rapists, despite the fact that he has sexually assaulted multiple women and bragged about it on tape. And current anti-immigrant, anti-Muslim policy and sentiment is the karmic fruit of 1980s dis immigration discourse. This is a direct pipeline, not an anomaly. The paradigm of neoliberal crimmigration is pr certainly proven profitable, far beyond its playful incar incarnation and genesis, illegal alien. Thank you. Q&A time, so if you have any questions, panelists, if you can sit up here, um, questions, um, and I believe we have at least 15 minutes, um, after which we'll have a closing reception. just my excuse to try this cool new thing. Um, thank you all very much. Very dynamic uh, range of, of presentations. Um, I'm, I just had a, I wanted to sort of just get us going with the very last uh, presentation, especially um, the, the question about the role of this nation of immigrants narrative. I'm wondering if you can say a, a little bit more about, um, you know, sort of how both, you know, how it's being, been playing out. I mean, my experience, is, is it echoing a lot? See, I had to mess up the cube, right? Okay, let's see. All right, how's this? Is that better? God, that was weird, okay. Um, you know, um, I've, been, I've been struck by it as this really strong rallying cry in this, you know, post-Trump election period, um, but I've been, as an African-American and an African-Americanist, you know, a bit concerned um, about the way in which it frames um, appropriate belonging, uh, not only for Native Americans, but for African Americans. So I guess I'm interested in that, and then I'm wondering, you know, what kinds of progressive, non-neoliberal ways might we be able to think about an, uh, alliances discursively that would, you know, transform that, or if, there anyone, if there's anyone who's doing that. Um, yeah, thank you. That's. That is, that is my, my concern, like it has been this rallying point that we'll know where this nation of immigrants are like the hashtag here to stay, um, immigrants make America great, you know, all those slogans, and it's, it's brought people together, but it's, there's the exclusions that are already underpinning it when we look at, well, who is that ideal immigrant? It's the white ethnic immigrant, and you know, I, how that happened is a complicated process. Um, but it's a white ethnic immigrant, and it's, it's also not, true because those white ethnic immigrants got an enormous amount of federal welfare. 
to the GI Bill, the housing bills, things like that, redlining. Um, white, white ethnic immigrants, well, some of them surely did work very hard, um, got a lot of federal aid and the aid of whiteness. And so this is this ideal, and then it was used in the 1980s to rationalize um, cutting welfare. And if someone was poor, you know, the, the argument went that they, basically the neoliberal argument is that like, well, you just didn't work hard enough, you deserved it. Um, so there's that within immigration discourses, and then the model minority discourse builds on that. Um, and the, the only valuable immigrant is the immigrant who is a part of a heteronormative family and is working really hard, so contributing to the capitalist economy. So that's the immigration piece. But then, of course, that whole discourse completely erases slavery <laughs> and African Americans, and it completely erases, like, here to stay on whose land? Um, and so my, my current work, I'm bringing uh, indigeneity and indigenous studies into conversation with this, and I'm actually writing about this right, right now and what's erased by it in that, that history of settler colonialism. Um, and so in looking, at, and I was at, I've been at many of the protests in New York City, and the Statue of Liberty was all over the place, and this idea of her as the mother of exiles, and um, it, ironically in the 1980s, it was immigrant mothers of color that were really attacked um, with immigration policy. And Prop, Prop 187 had its federal kind of comeuppance with the Personal Responsibility and Work Act. Um, so there's that, there's that piece of it, and then so what do we do? Um, and the, the kind of, um, some of the more progressive groups that I follow on social media and that I'm involved, involved with have more, uh, no bans on stolen land. That, that to me is more nuanced um, and brings these two things together. Um, and you know, the, the, oh, there's so many questions that come from that too. And like, what does it mean to be a colonizer if you're part of an, you know, are you a colonizer if you're a part of another historically disenfranchised, oppressed group? And um, what, what I'm learning as I become more and more familiar with indigenous studies and settler colonial studies is that these questions aren't resolved, <laughs> that they're part of nuanced conversations and that, and again, like I'm new to that, that field very much, but um, that place, it, it has to be place-based. It has to acknowledge the land. You and I were talking about this before. You know, there has to be an acknowledgement of the land if we're gonna talk about solidarity with native people. I mean, you know, this happened, the Muslim ban happened right after the Dakota Access Pipeline protest brought Native American visibility and ongoing violence at the hands of the state to mainstream media. And it was like it was forgotten immediately. Um, and all of a sudden it's a nation of immigrants everywhere. And so how, you know, what does social justice look like for both, both groups? I, I wish I had a more concrete answer. Um, yeah, no, I think on the ground, the, uh, uh, the Dakota pipeline for a moment actually represented a bringing together of, of kind of all of these issues, including immigrant rights folks were there as well as Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter, et cetera. And, and I, I understand the theory that you're advancing, which is I'm, I'm all for, uh, but what I consider as um, a bringing together continues to recognize that there are separate issues that are very deeply important to s different groups in the country. But what the groups are looking for are allies. They're looking to show up for other issues, but wanting in exchange, quite, quite understandably, that others show up for their issues as, as well. And again, I live in a bubble, you know, because that actually does happen in the Bay Area. Uh, but, but the Bay Area went to Dakota as well, uh, to the pipeline, and uh, they, it's, this is constantly part of the conversation. And, and an organization that's kind of emblematic of bringing at least the, uh, the African American issue uh, of, of over policing, et cetera, and immigration is BAJI, Black Alliance for Just Immigration, which I think they've moved the headquarters to San Francisco, even though it started in, in Oakland. Um, and um, the person who's the current executive director is actually one of the founders of Black Lives Matter as well. And so um, I, I think that it's kind of a strategic alliance that's being demanded 
on all fronts. Uh, and I think people are wanting to follow through on, on putting their effort where their mouth is. Uh, one of my questions was actually about uh, coalition and coalition building. Um, and I wondered, uh, Lydia, if you might uh, sort of talk a little bit about what you learned about Mexican and Puerto Ricans in Chicago and, and that kind of coalition building and dynamic um, in that particular geographic space and maybe what you've learned that we can sort of apply today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, you know, I think the reason that it's important to historicize what's going on now and to understand, you know, the longer uh, a tradition of the nativism and xenophobia and the anti-immigrant rhetoric is precisely because there have been other moments of this in the past, and including in Chicago in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. So one of the most interesting uh, things that I came across in looking at the experience of Mexican Americans in, in the 1960s in Chicago was that Puerto Ricans, who as we all know are US citizens, uh, would get caught up in the kinds of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the raids, the assaults on undocumented immigrants, and, or the search for suspected uh, undocumented immigrants. And so they talk about, uh, in some cases, how they are just as implicated as anyone else when people, when a police officer or immigration official can't distinguish uh, between someone who's Mexican or someone who's, from, you know, who's Puerto Rican. Uh, so that, I think, opens up uh, for some folks, the possibilities for solidarities and alliances, uh, for recognition of a common cause or you know, um, uh, facing similar kinds of circumstances. At the same time though, for others, I think it also um, motivates them to distance themselves from uh, Mexican immigrants precisely because they don't want to be associated with that kind of uh, Suspicion cast upon them as you know as illegitimate um, people in the society. So um, the, there are a lot of other examples of these moments when uh, these two populations have encountered one another, have had to reckon with each other. That's actually the the focus of my uh, my current book project, looking at Latino pan ethnic politics, moments when Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, and other Latinos, Cubans, Central Americans, South, South Americans, began to express and articulate solidarities, uh, alliances with each other, uh, and come together for a variety of different uh, political, but also social um, reasons uh, as well. Uh, yeah, but I actually I wanted to make a comment uh, to go back to uh, Professor Rose's question about the um, Immigrants Make America Great uh, issue. One of the ways that I think of getting at this, or the way that I approach this when, when talking about immigration with my students is to invoke a kind of hemispheric uh, sense of Americanness, that America is not just the United States of America, as Latin Americans will tell you all the time, right? That, it's, that um, you know, we've simply monopolized that term. Uh, and you know, I've come at this by thinking about the indigeneity of many of these immigrants from Latin America today, the fact that many of them are coming from Mayan communities, from Zapotec uh, communities, uh, and that the fact that there are people who have roots here in this part of the world. Now, of course, that works only for Latino immigrants, right, for people from Latin America, and so it's, it's not, um, we can't use that language to talk about immigrants from, from Asia or from Africa, for example. But I think the way that we can use it is in thinking about uh, how we've all made our way uh, to this you know, moment in time and this place where we are now uh, through different histories, whether that was history of um, enslaved labor, whether it was a uh, history of the expropriation of our land, uh, or a history of settler colonialism. And so I think one possible way to, or one alternative to this whole make, uh, I mean, immigrants make America great, or you know, we're an immigrant nation type of um, uh, you know, motif is to acknowledge what are often very painful histories uh, of different groups in the US, um, as Professor um, Hing was pointing to, and to simply say, regardless of how we 
came to be here, you know, we need to think about what kind of stance we take today vis-a-vis -vis others who are still just arriving. Can I add on something to that too? That was a really wonderful question. I think something that a lot of us have been thinking and talking about, so I was also talking with my students um, about this, this discourse around the nation of immigrants last week after reading um, Lisa Cacho's uh, book. And in that book, she briefly makes the point that um, documentation is so central to personhood in the, uh, Republican democracy. And so my students and I were thinking about how um, organizing could happen on the basis not of identity categories, but on uh, relationships to the state that are structured by documents, and that all kinds of groups can mobilize around documents and their, their, um, their failures in ways that could pose some really interesting possibilities for organizing. So people coming out of prison who struggle to get a birth certificate, um, homeless people who often don't have a lease, right? So that this idea, so that's just one example of how it's shifting away from an identity-based category like immigrants, broadly speaking, or the undocumented more particularly. Um, and there's legal scholars, I believe, who are writing about this, the limits of identity-based and status categories, and instead thinking about processes in relationship to, in this case, mm -hmm. paperwork. We've seen that one. Seen this one yet? Yeah, I always have seen the Make America Mexico again, Pat. Um, make America <laughs> Brown again. No, I haven't seen it. No, but you know, I, it's it, organizing around documents. Um, I understand that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to poo poo it. I, I'll just talk about a different issue. Organizing around family, I think, yeah. is a possibility because um, there have been various iterations of Simpson's attack on family. It's, it's like a, a sport in Washington, D.C. Uh, every couple of years, there's attack on family immigration. It puts us in a position of, of somehow we're supposed to, we're weak on immigration because we favor immigration. I mean, family, it's kind of weird. But one of the biggest allies of family immigration act that I found when, when I've testified and lobbied is the Black Congressional Caucus, actually, because they actually have made correlations between what happened during slavery and the breakup of families with the attempt to break up uh, immigrant families today. Hi, so I have a question for uh, Lara um, in regard to the dual migration streams and the spatial reorganization of whiteness. Um, so I'm wondering uh, what's uh, planning design's impact on Latino populations in suburbia? Can they rebuild uh, in, the, in the city in the same ways that you explained in your presentation? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat the first part of what you said? Can sure. planned design, is um, that what you're the, Yeah, like planning oh, yeah, design. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can they rebuild these communities? Um, the, the jury's out, the, most people believe probably not. So are you referring to the kinds of um, design schemes that are building on the things that Latino people are already doing to propose these new kinds of developments? Is that what you're thinking of? I'm thinking more about um, like from an urban and regional planning perspective, the design of, of a suburb, like okay. what may be the challenges and limitations of creating uh, these spaces in, in, in this uh, spatial identity. Uh -huh. Yeah, definitely. In terms of creating places that are more inclusive yes. for Latinos. Mm -hmm. So um, I showed a picture of the Pico Rivera sports arena. Um, and in it seems, on the one hand, to be a really internationally known and influential physical space. And yet this place is totally precarious. Um, it is, you know, it's uh, constantly at risk of bankruptcy. It has never been in the black. I always get those confused, in the black. Um, and that has everything to do with the ways that Latino migration to suburbia since the 1960s, but especially since the 1980s, has coincided with the industrialization. So um, William Fulton, who's, a, I believe, a political scientist and a planner, has written about this in an article in his book, um, and he refers to this as suburbs of extraction. So there was an interesting uh, phenomenon that happened in Los Angeles County where Latinos um, start moving into deindustrialized places because they were cheap, and so they become demographic majorities and they start electing representatives at this, and so you have majority Latino cities at the same moment in which there are almost no resources to control. Um, and so in those contexts, Latino elected officials in theory have a lot of political power, and these are suburbs, right? Um, they have a lot of political power, but almost no material basis to to distribute, right? So what they have done, as Fulton documented, was created pawn shops, they've tried to lure casinos, um, racetracks, other kinds of exploitative industries. So
So the Pico Rivera Sports Arena actually emerges out of a context like that. Um, Pico Rivera, at the time that this was created, was something like 65% Latino. It had three uh, Latino city council members out of a board of five. Um, and yet the, the lease of this thing, from the moment it was constructed, there were design flaws. And again, it, it remains, um, because of the tax base in the area, it remains really, really always threatened. Um, so I take, that's not a residential or mixed use kind of community, but that does, I think, point to the larger structural context that make exercising cultural citizenship in suburban space really hard. Um, and it's, it's always framed around the larger context of where the resources have gone. In this case, they're, they're often not in the suburbs anymore. They're in the central cities now, again, because of gentrification, and they're in, new, in the exurbs, far-flung suburbs outside of, of even suburbs. Um, and in rural areas of the country. So the suburbs have become, um, oddly, the, some of the hardest places to do those things, even though, even when they do become accessible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I have a quick question. I know that we are Oprah. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you all. Um, Better? Okay. Um, first, thank you all for your talk. Um, so I actually I wanted to follow up on a question with, with Laura. Um, what are what what is the like the populations which are in, in that you're identifying um, as having a sort of chato masculinity? What is their political rhetoric? What are they thinking about? What are, like are they are they also people who are attending like immigrant sort of rights rallies? Like what what is uh, do you know anything about them in, in yeah. that term? So my study is mostly historical, and historically they have been um, moderates, not left-wingers. And in fact, there have been, um, w one of the things that my book looks at in the 1970s is how Charros explicitly identified themselves as the more moderate um, political Latinos in, in comparison to Chicanos. Often they were coming from the same families, and so the, it was, you know, Charros tend to be a little older, actually, like 30s, 40s. Um, and so often they would have like college age sons and so there are family tensions around political ideology. Um, as a class they have tended to be homeowners. Um, they can be socially liberal on some issues but tend to be economically conservative and so they're, they're kind of a moderate class but complex within that. Yeah. Um. And that'll be our last question. Emma, you are. Last question. Yeah, you know, I, don't, I don't see I know. you, but I see you. Oh, there you are. Athletic. Uh, <laughs> thank you athletic, so much so to like all that. of you for such a wonderful <laughs> panel. I feel like I learned a lot this afternoon, and I have kind of a, a generalized question that I think a lot of you have touched on already, but I was curious to hear more about what you think of this particular moment as a time of race making, um, both through the legal policies that Professor King um, talked about that are being enacted as far as thinking of if we are in a moment when America is more diverse than ever before and coming out of a time when there was a lot of talk about color blindness or going beyond race, we're definitely now in a moment where racial categories are very much in the media and hardening in certain ways. And I'm just curious about whether I, going back to what Leah had mentioned before, about whether this is a moment of the possibility of racial coalition and building, or it's a time of closing doors and closing ranks in certain ways um, around race making and racial identities. And I'm just curious to hear you reflect upon that. You can start. Um, yeah, that's a great question, uh, Emma. I think that in some ways, The bright side of you know what's going on right now is that I think we are seeing a lot more um, solidarity work and coalition building, even if it's temporary, even if it only comes together around you know the airport that with you know after the Muslim ban or um, you know other crises, the Dakota Access Pipeline, etc. But what's what I have found really remarkable is the way the way in which people who support um, the Dakota Access Pipeline also understand what the problems are with the Muslim immigration ban, also are sympathetic to the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, 
and uh, LGBT rights and all sorts of other issues that I think you know we would associate with progressives or the left. Uh, so I, I see a lot of uh, possibility there. You know, I want I want to be uh, optimistic, um, and I I would take us back to the fact that I think um, the folks who have you know been able to unleash their xenophobia, their racism, <coughs> their misogyny, and, and you know, their transphobia or homophobia uh, at this particular moment have been emboldened you know, with, with the election of um, the, the occupant of the White House. But uh, although they've gotten the microphone right now, I think, and are, are able to feel perhaps empowered or validated in their feelings and you know, their anxieties and, and their angst, they're still a, a minority. I think, you know, the folks who, who, who support that kind of politics. And you can't change, uh, I mean, you can't stop the uh, demographic changes that are coming in, you know, now and, and in the future. So, so I think that we have to seize upon this moment to, you know, figure out what we will look like in 10, 20, 30 years and how we will continue to support um, the rights of anyone who's marginalized or oppressed in our society. I'll go. Um, you know, I, I'm repeating myself from what I said a little while ago, but yeah, I mean, this, this is a special time, this is a special challenge to communities of color to come together. Uh, because, and again, I'm about to say something that is not of my creation, it's other people smarter than me have come up with it, including people on this panel. It, it, it's Donald Trump was created by the Republican Party. He, his attack is not just on immigrants, his attack are on black, his attack are on women, and the, um, they, he and the Republican Party have been trying to put blacks in their place. They have been totally unsympathetic to the over-policing of the black community and buying into the broken windows theory of policing, et cetera. And that's something they've been talking about for generations. And the anti-immigrant stuff goes even further back. Uh, and when the Republicans were surprised that somehow he, th this, this monster appeared, it was their Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. Because uh, he just glommed on to all the stuff that he learned from them that was going to make him sellable to the Republican base, and we found out there's a huge, a much bigger Republican base out there than than we all thought. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it's a challenge to us that that we sh we better stand up together on this because it's not looking good. And um, if he sticks to this anti-Syrian thing. He's gonna be a president during wartime and his popularity is gonna rise. And um, I'm, I'm really concerned about that. Thank you, uh, Professor Hing, uh, Fernandez, Barakal, and Perry for taking the time for being here today. And thank you everybody who stayed um, all the way. <laughs> um, and I hope that today that you've not only learned more about the U.S. immigration regime and the politics of belonging, and it seems that belonging is part of what's at stake here um, in our country today. Um, thank you so much for your time and your poignant questions, and we welcome you to join us across the street um, at the closing ceremony, um, or closing reception, <laughs> not ceremony. <laughs> There'll be food. <laughs> um, and it's at the Center for Race and Ethnicity, and it is the building across the street. It has a purple door. Um, it's 96 Waterman Street. Thank you again, and please help me applaud our keynote and panelist speakers this time.